I remember the sunlight filtering through the trees as I, Terence McBride, walked along the trail, cracking a joke to my fellow search and rescue officer, Elton Hardingston. We were on our way to one of the most remote areas in Yellowstone National Park. Our mission was to look for a couple that had gone missing deep within the forest. Yellowstone National Park is known for its mountainous beauty and hidden gems such as hot springs and geysers. The path we took led us further away from familiar tourist trails and deeper into the secluded wilderness. The mature evergreens surrounding us provided a green canopy above, their thick trunks forming a seemingly impenetrable wall of wood on either side. As our search led us deeper into the forest, we stumbled upon something rather unexpected, the remnants of an undistinguishable meal scattered across the ground. At first glance, Elton and I passed it off as leftovers from some unfortunate hiker's encounter with a bear. But upon closer inspection, we couldn't identify any bear tracks around the area. So why do bears never wear shoes? joked Elton, trying to lighten up the mood. Because they prefer their bare feet. He chuckled, but I forced a smile out as unease started to take hold. Soon after discovering this odd incident, we reached the campsite where the couple was last known to be staying. We did not find them there. Instead, we found deep claw marks on some of the trees that were much larger than what any bear could inflict. Dusk approached quickly as the sun dipped below the horizon casting eerie shadows everywhere. As we prepared to set up our tents near the campsite for an overnight stay before resuming our search in daylight, I noticed an unsettling lack of bird calls and wildlife sounds around us. By midnight, wrapped in my sleeping bag inside my tent next to Elton's tent outside which lay our camping weapons, like guns and knives just in case, I couldn't shake this overwhelming feeling of being watched. A sudden scream in the darkness pierced the silence. I jolted upright, hands searching for my flashlight. Elton's voice in the darkness called out, Did you hear that too? I'm not dreaming this time. I replied as we hastily exited our tents, armed for defense. Beneath the moonlight, we cautiously followed the direction of the scream through the dense forest assuming it was one of the missing hikers we were looking for. In front of us was a gruesome sight, a partially eaten deer left for dead. What really caught my attention was how precise the wounds were, as if inflicted with surgical skill rather than by a hungry bear. As I examined the carcass more closely, an icy shiver crawled down my spine. Something had been watching us this entire time. Suddenly, Frantic rustling and snaps of twigs nearby alerted me to a presence lurking just beyond our line of sight. That was when we caught our first glimpse of it. A creature that stood tall on four limbs, towering above us like a demonic specter from an old folk tale. Its elongated snout revealed rows of razor-sharp teeth glinting silver under the moonlight. Leathery wings spread out wide as its piercing red eyes seemed to burrow into mine. Wordlessly, Elton and I raised our guns at this unknown beast as it lunged forward with remarkable speed. The terrifying chase began, through the labyrinthine forest, as we narrowly dodged its rapid strikes and bites at any exposed flesh. I desperately called for assistance while trying to keep up with Elton as he fired back at this relentless nightmare creature pursuing us. No animal we'd ever encountered in our years of search and rescue missions had behaved quite like this. It wasn't an attack made from hunger, but like it was taking a twisted pleasure in hunting us down. We continued running, as the creature relentlessly pursued us. Our legs burned from exhaustion. My mind was racing, trying to think of an escape plan. I decided we needed help so I managed to pull out my radio and attempted to contact headquarters. We're under attack by an unknown creature. We need backup immediately. I shouted into the radio. There was no response. The intensity of the situation must have caused interference with the signal. 
Elton and I reached a clearing and stopped for a moment, trying to catch our breath. The moonlight illuminated the grotesque appearance of the creature, making it even more terrifying. Its hideous form resembled something from a twisted nightmare, as it stalked us closely like a predator stalking its prey. We resumed running, this time in the direction of a nearby river we had passed earlier on our search for the missing hikers. If we could make it there, perhaps we could swim across and put some distance between us and this unnatural monster. The creature eventually followed us into the water, snarling and thrashing about violently as it struggled to keep pace with us. Elton noticed that the beast was having difficulty swimming while maintaining its footing on two of its legs, a crucial weakness. Hurry! Elton shouted as he pulled me onto the river bank on the other side. Once we reached safety on dry land, we took advantage of the few moments the creature needed to recover from its aquatic exertion. Headquarters, do you copy? We need assistance now. I called desperately into my radio. This time, there was a crackling response. We're sending back up your way. Hold on, said a voice from headquarters. Elton and I continued sprinting through the forest, moving away from the monstrous creature that resumed stalking us from afar once it had recovered entirely. Our desperate cries for help paid off when we finally spotted several searchlights emanating from an approaching helicopter, shaking the treetops as it descended to our location. As we climbed aboard the rescue aircraft, it seemed like the worst was over. However, a piercing screech filled the air, and the terrifying creature we tried to escape emerged from the forest and lunged toward us one last time. The rescue crew reacted swiftly, managing to open fire on the beast in midair. The bullets tore into its flesh, causing it to reel back and tumble onto the ground below. As we ascended to safety, I couldn't help but look down at the grisly scene unfolding on the forest floor. The creature lay motionless, tendrils of dark crimson blood rapidly pooling around its lifeless form. We later learned that local authorities had discovered several more mutilated animal carcasses in the vicinity of our encounter with the monster. Whatever its origin or motivations were would remain a mystery, but one thing was certain. We may have survived our horrifying ordeal, but we would never forget those who lost their lives as victims of this unknown creature. As our rescue helicopter soared towards civilization and into the night sky, I glanced back one final time at the dense forest receding behind us. The terrifying events that had just unfolded would lurk for eternity as a vivid memory within my mind, a chilling reminder of those dark secrets that lay hidden within otherwise picturesque landscapes. For years ago, I worked in the vast Sequoia National Forest, California. I'm Martin Shaw, mild-mannered forest worker. With every day spent laboring among those majestic trees, I'd find a bit of solace. My occupation was fulfilling but often lonely. In time, loneliness drives a person to forge friendships wherever they can be found. Crazy Teddy and Jack, Draw Knife, Thomas were my best pals in the forest workplace. Teddy acquired his name from his quirky sense of humor, whereas Jack got his from his skill in woodworking. One day, as we finished lunch by our dashed red pickup truck, Teddy chimed in with a joke. Why don't scientists trust atoms? He asked, grinning ear to ear. I give up, I replied with a smile. Because they make up everything he howled. Later that week, I headed toward my regular work area to resume tasks. As my boots crunched the fallen leaves on the forest floor, a gnawing sensation grew stronger, for different local folks had disappeared without a trace. Of course, kidnappings or disappearances were not unheard of even in small communities like ours, but this felt eerie. By noon that day, 
Just as I was wishing for Ted's lousy jokes to lighten the mood again, an unsettling cry reached my ears. Quickly making my way in the direction of the sound with a pounding heart, I found Jack cradling an injured left arm near some brush. What on earth are you doing here and what happened to you? I asked him quickly trying to remain calm. Jack stared at me wide-eyed before frantically saying, I don't know what it is, but something attacked us near O'Sullivan Bridge that I had barely escaped when it got hold of Teddy. Without another thought, I grabbed my nearby axe and urged Jack to seek help at our base camp. I ventured uncautiously with sweaty palms gripping the axe handle. As I approached the bridge, a sense of foreboding consumed me. Crossing it, I spotted some torn clothing in a shrubbery with Teddy's pager beeping incessantly beside it. Muttering his name nervously under my breath, I continued to search for my friend, but found myself descending into darkness. Lost in thought, I nearly stumbled over the fresh carcass of a deer, its limbs twisted and mangled in ways that no ordinary creature could have managed. With every passing step, dread strangled me tighter. It was then I stumbled upon the most horrifying sight a creature feasting on a human corpse, Teddy's lifeless body beside it. The beast had human-like qualities but resembled nothing like any living being I have ever seen. Misshapen and grotesque in appearance, its limbs appeared long and sinewy. My breathing hitched and the creature turned towards me with blood-soaked face revealing a row of sharp teeth ready to tear into its next meal. With all trustworthy humanity gone, I darted away from certain death heading back towards the base camp. My heart pounded rapidly, and the need to find safety overwhelmed me. I sprinted back to the base camp as quickly as my legs could carry me. Upon my arrival... I found Jack and a few others from our group huddled together in fear. We heard screams. What happened out there? One of them asked, their voice trembling. It's Teddy. I choked out. He's, he's dead. There's something out there. We need to call for help immediately. However, before we could reach for our phones, someone pointed out that there was no signal in this remote area. Panic ensued, but we couldn't afford to lose any more time or lives. Our only option was to send someone to the nearest town for help while the rest of us stayed put in a makeshift shelter within the campsite. But what if that thing comes here? One of the group members asked nervously. It'll be riskier for all of us to split up and try to leave now. One person going for help is our best chance. I replied firmly. We reluctantly agreed on a plan, and one brave member volunteered to journey into town. The rest of us hunkered down in the shelter, taking turns keeping watch while others rested. We all knew that sleep wasn't going to come easily tonight. Hours passed agonizingly slow as we tried to keep quiet and still, listening intently for any unnatural sounds or movement outside our refuge. Finally, as dawn broke on the horizon, we heard the distant hum of an approaching vehicle. The sound never seemed more welcomed. It was a search and rescue team with reinforcements from local law enforcement. When our messenger had reached town and relayed our situation, they'd acted swiftly. We breathed a collective sigh of relief as we left our hiding place knowing we were no longer alone against this terrifying foe. As they carefully examined the area where Teddy had met his gruesome end, the sheriff turned to us, asking what we knew about this horrifying creature. We hesitated, knowing how improbable our encounter sounded. We can't say for sure what it was, I stammered, desperately trying to put it into words. It was beyond anything human or recognizable. It had an almost human-like body but distorted, with elongated limbs and a face. God, I'll never forget that face. It was covered in blood and had rows of sharp teeth just ready to tear into flesh. The sheriff remained somber and quiet as he took in our description. 
He eventually decided that their team should scour the area while we were escorted back to town for our safety. During the following days, search teams scoured the woods for any sign of a creature matching our description or for potential unexplained deaths, but they found nothing. Eventually, an official statement claimed that a large, aggressive animal could have been responsible for Teddy's death and emphasized the importance of safety in nature. We knew better. This was no ordinary animal. But perhaps some answers were never meant to be found, and some horrors were never meant to be confronted. As for us who had survived the ordeal in those woods where we lost Teddy, the memory of that terrifying creature would forever haunt our nightmares. A chilling reminder that there are things out there beyond comprehension lurking in the shadows. The world would never know what truly killed Teddy on that fateful day near O'Sullivan Bridge, but we all held on to a deep resolve, a commitment, to honor his memory by living life courageously and genuinely, always caring for one another while facing each moment with strength and determination knowing that life is a precious gift and is not guaranteed tomorrow. It was one of those nights where sleep felt like a distant luxury. My name's Arnold McCreary, and as a small-town cop in quiet shores, Oregon, I've had my fair share of long nights. The town itself is a picturesque mix of dense forests and misty shoreline, the perfect setting for every creepy story you can imagine. Tonight, I had the eerie feeling that something was off. Yet, despite my general skepticism, I brushed it off as just another slow night shift. Hey Arnold, called out Randall Pembroke from across the station. You hear about that missing person case today? No, I replied, leaning back in my squeaky chair. Tell me about it. Well, he hesitated for a moment. The Vic's name is Gregory Wilkerson. Family can't find him since this morning. Now alert, I replied with a slight chuckle to lighten the mood. Sounds like Greg just needed to escape his mother-in-law for a bit. If only it were that simple, said Randall with a troubled expression. Just then, the radio crackled into life from an incoming report. It was Delia Gustafson, on patrol near the old abandoned cannery. The place has been mostly left alone by locals. Some say it's cursed. Of course, we cops don't believe in such nonsense. Dispatch. Her voice came through in hurry bursts. I need assistance here. Found Greg's car abandoned. Looks like there's blood inside. Not wasting any time, Randall and I hopped into our cruiser and raced towards the cannery as Delia kept us updated over the radio. Upon arriving at the dark and foreboding building, any rational skepticism melted away as we were met by an unnerving sight. The door to the cannery hung open with claw marks splintering its wood. This wasn't the result of a thief or any ordinary criminal. Armed with our flashlights and weapons, we descended down the dusty steps, driven by the duty to seek out the truth and keep our town safe. The murky atmosphere felt heavy inside the crumbling building. Sounds echoing through the empty space made it nearly impossible to discern which way was up and which way was down. Soon, we came across a horrifying scene. Greg's mangled body lay on the floor, shredded by what looked like enormous talons. What in God's name could have done this? gasped Randall, the fear evident in his voice. I don't know, I said, struggling to stay focused on the task at hand, but we need to find Delia. She might be in danger. Our search led us deeper into the cannery, where we stumbled upon what looked like a nest made from human remains. The smell was overwhelming. At that moment, we heard a terrifying growl echoing through the darkness. It was a sound that sent shivers down our spines despite our desire for courage. And then we saw it. 
A monstrous creature lurked in the shadows, half hidden behind corroding machinery, a grotesque mix of human and beast with matted fur covering its muscular frame and razor-sharp teeth gleaming in its elongated snout. Its deep-set yellow eyes held an animalistic rage that seemed almost unnatural. With our weapons drawn, Randall dared to take a shot at the creature. However, bullets appeared to have little effect as it launched itself towards us with unnerving speed and agility. We scrambled to retreat further into the cannery's bowels while radioing for backup. As if sensing its prey slipping away, terror grew more intense as the air chills whipped around us and mocked us with their eerie whispers. It wasn't just Greg anymore. Now each of us had unwittingly become part of this wicked hunt. That feeling was suffocating us every moment, in this forsaken place, that once used to be frequented by locals in search of precious food. Tables and chairs cluttered most of the rooms that we entered, obstructing our path forward. There were muffled screams and cries during our chase down the rusty corridors and stairs. Left and right, only ending with the sickening crunch of bone needing unfathomable force. The radio cracked and became static, as if nothing was going to save us now. It was far from the comedy gold we had in the precinct earlier today. As we cautiously continued our desperate escape from the nightmarish creature, sweat poured down our faces, making it hard to concentrate. The sharp sound of metal being destroyed echoed across the walls, constantly reminding us of the imminent danger. Our fellow officers tried helping by pulling debris blocking the narrow pathways while others positioned themselves as human shields to protect our retreat and give us a fighting chance. Despite Randall's failed attempt at stopping it earlier, he didn't hesitate to shoot again, aiming for its glowing yellow eyes. A spine-chilling howl filled our ears as we realized his shot had found its mark. But it only seemed to enrage the fiend even more, making it hungrier, more determined. Sarah, one of our most experienced officers and renowned for her quick thinking under pressure, yelled out to us, Get to the exit! We need backup! I'll try and buy you some time! Her voice was filled with a sense of purpose, though none of us dared consider what would happen to her once she stayed behind. Sprinting through the dimly lit corridors with debris crushing under our footsteps, we heard Sarah's gunfire fading in the distance. Each shot felt like our last hopes slipping away. The creature's roars only grew angrier and more malicious. We finally stumbled upon what looked like an old emergency exit rusted yet functional. Officer Duane slammed his shoulder into the door. It creaked open, letting in streams of purple twilight. Breathing heavily with exhaustion and fear, we hastily left the forsaken cannery behind, only pausing once outside to attempt calling for backup on our radios again. This time they were working, Relief washed over us as we managed to alert HQ about what had transpired within that hellish factory. Moments later, red and blue flashing lights cut through the darkness. Sirens could be heard from afar as help arrived at the scene. We need to set up a perimeter. Officer Duane ordered while the rest of us merely stared blankly, emotionally drained and afraid. We can contain this thing. We have the skills and resources. We aren't letting it take another one of us. As we waited for more units to arrive, an overwhelming sense of guilt clawed through us for leaving Sarah and the other officers who had acted as human shields behind. It wasn't just about individual survival now. We needed to make sure their sacrifices meant something. When enough reinforcements had gathered, we explained to them what exactly we had faced inside the decaying walls of the cannery. Skepticism appeared in their eyes, but the sheer determination in our voices coupled with the torn pieces of uniform worn by the fallen officers was enough to convince them of what had transpired. The operation began immediately. Expert teams surrounded the perimeter, 
snipers position themselves in elevated locations, while highly trained K-9 units awaited their cue to enter the building. We knew it was going to be a long and treacherous battle against an enemy that defied logic or reason. Hours turned into days, yet there was no sign of either the creature nor any survivors that could be found within that forsaken place. The operation wound down as people started realizing whatever it was we had encountered might have slipped away in those early moments. All that remained were our memories and condolences for those brave officers who'd given their lives for ours. Some searched for answers after those chaotic days at the cannery, looking into folklore or old myths trying to identify the frightening fiend we encountered. Local news reported on our findings and theorized possible links to long-lost species only spoken of in whispers. For those of us who'd been there, that made no difference. Monster or not, cryptid or living nightmare, all we could think about were the friends whose lives had been taken. Our only goal was to ensure their memories and sacrifices would not be in vain. Even as years passed, that monstrous creature cast a long, dark shadow on our lives, one from which we could never escape. The loss of Sarah and the others weighed heavy on our hearts while we couldn't help fear that when it's least expected, those cold yellow eyes would appear in the shadows once more. I had always been a city dweller, but I needed a change. That's when I rented this cabin in the Lake Tahoe woods for a short getaway. My name is Lachlan Bodan, and I work as a construction manager out in Carson City. I thought the solitude would be refreshing, but I never imagined what lurked in these woods. Upon my arrival at the cabin, I was instantly impressed with the rustic setting. The cabin was small but cozy, made of weathered pine logs and nestled deep within the conifers. On my leisurely first day here, with no inkling of the events to come, I spent hours exploring the lush surroundings. It all began on my second day in Tahoe when I met Vivica Fitzhugh, a rare name for an enchanting soul. Our encounter happened on one of my exploratory hikes around the lake, and we quickly became friends. Vivica was staying in another cabin nearby and had also taken refuge in the woods to escape her mind-numbing job back in San Francisco as an accountant. That night, we planned to make dinner together at my cabin. Sharing stories over boiling pots of soup and sizzling steaks was like therapy for us both. We laughed at each other's jokes and marveled at surprising similarities in our pasts. While prepping our meal... We heard rustling outside slow, methodical footsteps encircling the cabin. I poked my head out to investigate but saw nothing alarming, only crisp pine needles crushing beneath my own weight. We finished our dinner without incident but were soon startled by a muffled scream from far away too distant for anyone to recognize precisely where it came from. Despite temptation to help whoever needed it, we knew it would be dangerous to venture out blindly into the darkening forest. The next day began with a disturbing discovery red stained clothes strewn sporadically over a small clearing in the pines. Further investigation revealed smeared blood trails on rocks nearby. The thought sent shivers down my back, but I tried to rationalize the scene before me. Perhaps it was just an animal's attack on another woods dweller? Vivica and I made our way to the closest village to ask for assistance. Maybe someone there could help us understand what transpired without raising alarm among its inhabitants. A village elder named Alaric Wheaton described legends of a hideous creature reportedly inhabiting these woods that was quadrupedal with elongated limbs, extremities capable of slashing through anything in its path. The tales were dismissed by most villagers as cautionary superstitions meant to keep children away from danger, but Alaric fervently believed these stories held some truth. Despite his convictions, 
both Vivica and I struggled with the notion that a perceptibly fictitious creature could be responsible for such brutal acts. We thanked Alaric for his story and reluctantly decided not to involve law enforcement at this time. We returned to our cabins with skepticism but resolved to remain vigilant. We locked doors and took extra precautions when venturing outside after sundown. Newfound fear gripped our conversations and replaced the once buoyant atmosphere between us. Days went by without incident. Our tension began dissipating like fog over a rising sun. Perhaps we had grown complacent and unguarded, but that would prove to be our undoing. One evening, while clearing away fogged window panes of my cabin to catch sight of Vivica arriving from her day job shadowing park rangers, I caught a glimpse of movement in the clearing among the trees. Its silhouette slunk through shadows toward Vivica's cabin. It was unnaturally tall with extended appendages that glided across ground effortlessly as if imbued with malicious intent. The fleeting sight made my heart pound like a jackhammer, yet I dared not move a muscle. When Vivica finally emerged from her cabin in the twilight, she saw me standing stiffly by my window, gesturing at the sinister silhouette I had spotted. Her heartbeat seemed to catch up with mine as we both realized that this was what the locals feared. The unseen adversary bolted towards Vivica, and she sprinted back to her cabin, slamming the door behind her. We locked ourselves in our respective cabins and spoke urgently through crackling walkie-talkies. We couldn't risk going outside now that a predator lurked among us. Vivica and I stayed tucked away in our cabins, fearful of the creature lurking just outside. We sensed that our safety hung by a thin thread, and we had to act before it sliced through our cabin's walls. We contacted the park rangers that Vivica had previously shadowed during her day job. Our frantic voices conveyed the urgency of the threat we faced, and they came to our aid without delay. Together with the rangers, we convened in my cabin to discuss how to handle the menace that haunted us. The rangers listened intently as we mentioned the tall, lanky figure that slithered through the shadows— silently listening and waiting for an opportunity to strike. We noted its extended appendages and unnatural stature, which baffled even the experienced park rangers. One of them mentioned a rare animal species called the mantis man, an isolated case seen in this region known for its tall, thin structure and elongated limbs. It was usually mistaken for an urban legend by locals. The resemblance was uncanny, but none of us could be sure if this was actually what we were dealing with. We decided not to call the local authorities since most likely they would dismiss our fears as baseless, given there were no reports of physical harm nor substantial evidence for such a creature's existence. In an attempt to escape and avoid confrontation with the antagonist, Vivica and I packed our essentials while the park rangers maintained watch outside. Sweat dripped down my forehead as I stole anxious glances towards the darkening horizon. We tried to move swiftly yet stealthily in order not to attract unwanted attention from our hidden enemy. It was only when my gaze fell on a figure far below in the distance that I realized how gravely wrong we were in attempting an escape. There it loomed near one of the ranger's patrol vehicles, its elongated limbs stretching far out enough to envelop one of the rangers who had remained near the truck as a lookout. It let out an eerie screech that sent chills down my spine, and in that instant, our entire plan backfired. We brought this horrifying scene upon ourselves with our panicked decision. The other rangers, initially stunned by this sudden revelation— finally snapped out of their trance and scrambled to help their colleague. Armed with tranquilizers and firearms, the brave park rangers charged toward the creature, aiming to disable and capture it. Vivica stood frozen in terror, shielding her eyes from the gruesome sight. 
I forcefully grabbed her arm and pulled her towards my vehicle while maintaining eye contact with the ongoing struggle playing across the clearing. Neither Vivica nor I could stop thinking about the fallen ranger. He had only come here to assist us but fell victim to a merciless attack by our mysterious enemy. His sacrifice would not be forgotten. Disregarding all previous plans for stealth and speed, I cranked up the ignition while bullets ricocheted around us. The blaring engine alerted the creature of our imminent escape. It spun its head towards us just as we sped away from its clutches. It screeched its final blood-curdling howl, rendered helpless as we sought refuge miles away from that cursed woodland area. As we left the nightmare behind us, unsure if it had been captured or killed, we tried to move on with our lives. But we couldn't ignore mourning the brave ranger who lost his life in a desperate attempt to save ours. Neither Vivica nor I could ever shake off that immense burden— a debt owed to someone who paid such a high price for our safety. We honored him in our hearts every day for his bravery and sacrifice, echoing his name in hushed whispers filled with gratitude and respect. The chilling reminder of encountering that sinister creature will always remain etched deep within us, a scar on the pages of our past, a symbol of an adversary that shook us to our core, leaving us questioning our very existence. I was driving along the isolated Route 50 in Nevada, known as the loneliest road in America. My name is Jack Thorne, a retired mechanic, divorced but still friendly with my ex nothing too dramatic. I needed the solitude that this road offered after losing both my parents recently. Just me and the open road to clear my head. Pulling into the Ely gas station, I noticed the weary cashier. Busy night? I joked, hoping to lighten her mood. She sighed. Missing persons report on the news, fifth one this month. I offered her a smile and continued on my way. By nightfall, I stopped in Eureka, checked into the Gold Mine Motel, and made conversation with Rosie, the receptionist. So, what do you think about all these disappearances? I asked. No one knows, she said. Just gone. Folks around here are spooked. I didn't know it yet but it wouldn't be long before I encountered what they feared most. The next day, exploring the rustic streets of Eureka led me into an old building full of mining relics. There, I encountered a young man named Jeremy Fisher who shared stories of his family's time spent working in hazardous conditions down in those cavernous mines. He showed me peculiar scratches on mining helmets found abandoned deep within an unrevealed mine shaft. The marks intrigued me. Could it be connected to those missing? This mystery began to consume me. That evening, I met Larry Jenkins and Lenore Duncan at a local dive bar over burgers and beer. Things were normal till last month, Larry said. Now folks don't dare go too far from town. Lenore clutched her pearls with unease. She feared their marriage may crumble following her husband's disturbing encounter in their backyard, his left hand severed by something unidentifiable. Please be careful, Jack, Lenore implored. The next morning, I ventured to one of the abandoned mines and cautiously descended. The deeper I went, the colder and more oppressive it became. As I rounded a bend, an eerie scratching sound echoed within the tunnel. I peeked in and saw them, reptilian creatures with razor-like claws and skin-like pale leather, covered in dirt and blood. My heart pounded as the creature devoured its meal an unrecognizable victim. I scrambled backward, managing not to alert the being. When I reached the surface, I was gasping for air. Feverishly tracking down Jeremy Fisher that evening, 
I showed him photos of the creature's claw marks hoarded deep inside the mine. They match those found on his family heirlooms. We need to warn our family, friends, Jeremy said urgently. In haste, we gathered Larry and Lenore at the bar to strategize how best to disseminate this revelation. Urgency tugged at us every moment we knew staying out late posed even greater risks. Halfway through our conversation, a power outage plunged us into darkness. With only shaking candlelight guiding us back home, apprehension gripped our bones. On our journey home, we passed an abandoned house in which floorboards creaked ominously. Something had been there recently. Sheepishly peering in from outside, we spotted one of the reptilian creatures gnawing on what was left of another human corpse. Fear seized us as we realized that the abandoned house was no longer a safe refuge from the reptilian creatures. It was evident that they had been in the area and had hunted humans. Time was against us. We couldn't afford to ignore our instincts any longer. We have to get out of town now, Larry said grimly. What about other people? Lenore asked, her voice quavering. We can't just leave them in danger. I know, Jeremy replied, but we have no idea what we're up against. If we don't leave, we might be the next victims. We agreed to return to our homes, gather our essential belongings, and warn as many people as possible before making our escape. We felt compelled to call for help but were unsure who could aid us the authorities would likely deem our claims outrageous or unbelievable. If these creatures were lurking right under their noses, what made us think they'd be of assistance? It was a heavy burden for us to shoulder alone our warning could save countless lives. Nevertheless, fear of disbelief made us hesitant about calling for official help. Having no time to lose, we split up and briskly walked to our respective abodes, hearts pounding and eyes darting with fear at every slight movement or sound in the shadows around us. When I arrived at my doorstep, I silently thanked the universe for my safety up until this point. I scoured my house for essential supplies, food, water, flashlight, and caught sight of a family photo on the mantel. A stabbing pain filled my chest as I considered their ignorance towards this impending danger. Walking hurriedly toward Jeremy's house, he was closest. I noticed his door cracked open when I reached it. Knowing that something must be wrong, I cautiously entered his home. The sight that awaited me left me speechless. My stomach twisted into tight knots at the horrifying scene before me. There, lying lifeless on the living room floor, were Jeremy's mother and father, gruesome slashes marring their skin. The reptilian creatures had been here, too. Panic coursed through me as I dashed through the rooms to find Jeremy. He was standing in his bedroom, trembling furiously while holding a kitchen knife. I could see anger, fear, and disbelief etched on his face. We have to go. I managed to whisper with words heavy on my tongue. We grouped together once more at the agreed rendezvous point in town. Larry and Lenore appeared unharmed, much to our relief. We exchanged sad looks as Jeremy whispered that his parents were dead. The weight of our likelihood against the creatures grew heavier with every passing second. As we piled into Larry's truck, we glanced at a city map spread out on the dashboard. Determining a direction for our escape was crucial for our survival. North, Jeremy croaked out with sorrow lacing his voice. Why the north? Lenore asked gently. Less populated areas, Jeremy replied. Fewer potential victims. We pulled away from town without looking back at what we left behind. Families, friends and homes now threatened by nightmarish predators. Our priority was gaining distance from those seemingly unstoppable creatures capable of tearing humanity apart. 
For several days, we traveled northward with news reports keeping us company on the radio of possible reptilian-defying incidents. We experienced relief and terror simultaneously. It seemed we made the right choice in leaving but remained haunted by knowing that everyone back home was still terrorized by those nightmarish beings. Lasting communication became scarcer as our journey progressed. Those back home questioned us less frequently about our abrupt departures. We knew they were suspicious but felt no inclination to subject them to ridicule or fear if they didn't take our warnings about the creatures seriously. We agonized over our inability to help but hoped that the insight we shared had changed some minds. Upon reaching a remote and seemingly deserted cabin in the woods, we finally halted. Jeremy, Larry, Lenore, and I grieved for the enormous loss with heavy hearts. The monster was still out there, relentless in its pursuit of human flesh. Its grisly murders were inexorable. The four of us clung together in a bond forged from fear. We searched for normalcy amid chaos steadfastly hoping that one day the creatures would be eradicated and humanity could recover. I am Charles McDuff, a private investigator based in Pittsburgh. My life used to be monotonous until the day everything changed. A mysterious case landed on my desk reports of a missing person called Jenny Calhoun. In the gritty alleys of Pittsburgh, I began my investigation. The city was alive with life and noise, every corner teeming with stories waiting to be discovered. I found myself digging into Jenny's past diving into her daily routines, contacts, and her interests. Jenny wasn't an ordinary person— she was a journalist fascinated with the urban legends of the Steel City. My investigation led me through libraries, archives, and interviews with other journalists. I stumbled upon a common thread among their stories a humanoid wolf creature that was reported to prowl the city's darkest corners. Many tales surrounded this figure. Some said it was a misfit seeking justice while others believed it was a rampant killer on the loose. One thing remained consistent its tendency to remain elusive. Talking to Jenny's family didn't reveal much either. They were devastated by her disappearance and unsure of what could have led her down this path. To them, she was just doing her job like any other journalist. I continued my search in the darkest corners and alleys of Pittsburgh where most would fear to tread. Piles of garbage are strewn about as people went about their business, unaffected by what might lurk in the shadows behind them. Then one evening, as I was walking down an alley near Liberty Avenue, I stumbled upon something horrifying. Sprawled out near a dumpster was the badly mutilated body of another missing person, Walter Zane. Anyone who passed by could see evidence of carnage in his earthly remains deep gashes and bite marks riddled his once-living form. The crime scene didn't offer much evidence, but it prompted me to dig deeper into similar cases around Pittsburgh. The more I learned, the more I found connections to the elusive predator, the humanoid wolf creature. But what kind of animal could perpetrate such heinous acts? For a moment, I recalled an episode of The X-Files I watched as a teenager. Could it be anything like that? No, surely not reality isn't adapted from pulp fiction. But the idea dangled within my investigations. I started combing witnesses' accounts, poring over crime scenes looking for anything that might have slipped past law enforcement. Every lead turned out to be a dead end until I interviewed an old janitor named Oscar who worked near a gym on Forbes Avenues. Oscar described an encounter in which he saw a hulking figure with fur and wolf-like features creep through the gym's parking lot under the cover of darkness. Too frightened to intervene or get a closer look, Oscar hid in his cleaning supply closet until dawn assured him it was safe to emerge. His eyewitness account provided me with something— 
a valuable piece of information about where the humanoid wolf might traverse or occasionally hunt. With time, however, dawned on me that catching such an elusive and dangerous creature might require help. So I contacted Jenny's friends and co-workers, forming an informal team of investigators. One night we equipped ourselves with flashlights, pepper spray, and other self-defense tools, embarking on a stakeout of one of the areas where we suspected this monster could frequent. We hid in different shadows and corners, waiting for something to pass by unknown what we might find. Hours passed, and Oscar and I started to believe we were chasing shadows. Suddenly, we heard a guttural growl from behind the gym. Out of instinct, our group scrambled to communicate with each other, whispering to confirm everyone's safety. We agreed to approach the source of the noise cautiously. We knew if something went wrong, calling for help might not be fast enough to save us. As we got closer to the gym's backside, I noticed blood dripping from a nearby trash can, leading towards a gap in the fence. Fear crept inside me, but I pushed it back and focused on every step I took. Heart pounding, we peered through the fence into the adjacent alleyway. There, we found a horrific scene. One of Jenny's co-workers, Sarah, lay lifeless on the ground. Blood pooled around her mauled body. No time for grief or shock. We could hear rustling nearby. A moment later, the creature emerged from the darkness. The massive, wolf-like humanoid stood on its hind legs with razor-sharp teeth exposed in a snarl while blood dripped from its claws. The sight confirmed Oscar's account and exceeded my worst fears. Paralyzed by terror, my companions and I knew that confronting this beast was impossible without learning more about it first. Instead of calling for help and potentially drawing attention to ourselves from the monster, which would put everyone in danger, or worse, having no one believes us, we decided to focus on hiding and observing. Desperation took over as it felt like there was no escape or way to overcome this monstrosity without risking more lives. I signaled my team to move towards a side entrance of the gym where it was still dark enough not to be seen by the creature as it moved further down the alleyway. Whispered voices caused alarm chatter about Sarah while trying to piece together what happened. As much as we wanted to report the attack, making a phone call would draw attention, and none of us knew who or how to call to fight such an unknown creature. All we could do was plan to notify the police once we had put some distance between ourselves and the beast. We remained hidden, listening as its breathing grew heavier, a sign that it was getting agitated. Finally, it turned its attention away from us long enough for our group to find another hiding spot inside the gym's basement. There, we huddled in terrified silence, praying that it wouldn't catch our scent and find its way down to us. After what seemed like an eternity, we heard footsteps above us begin to subside. Gathering every ounce of courage, I decided it was time for my team to make their way out of the gym and contact the police. In our panicked state, our thoughts raced. If anyone even entertained our claims, what could they do? We weighed the risks of explaining what we saw versus holding on to information that could lead to more tragedies. I began documenting every detail from our encounter with the monster where we saw it, specific features, and its apparent strength. I held on to my notes, and waited while my friends called emergency services one by one. We all shared versions of what happened without diving into too much detail about what attacked Sarah, as much as we wanted to scream out that there was a werewolf-like creature on the loose based on what logic could suggest. Our fear of disbelief kept us from doing so. As soon as Jenny's group words finally reached law enforcement, they arrived at the scene. Seeing Sarah's mangled body with their own eyes left them perplexed and feeling helpless in finding her attacker. Our little band of investigators disbanded after the official investigation began. 
in our hearts, we knew something beyond human comprehension had terrified us forever, an unknown predator prowling throughout these streets at night. Too many lives had been lost already, but we could never unveil what we knew and endured. Paranormal creatures like werewolves were out of the public's understanding, things that belonged to fiction tales, stories too outlandish to face acknowledgement. Wrapped in our own thoughts and fearing becoming targets again, each one of us tried to forget about the inhuman adversary that now haunted our dreams. It was my first summer as a fire lookout in the Bitterroot National Forest, a dense labyrinth of pine and silence that crested the Montana sky. A city man by birth, I sought solitude amid giants and took to the solitary life with the ease of a hermit crab to a shell. They called me Terence Shoals, but out here names rarely mattered. I spent my days in the tower scanning for smoke and savoring the expanse below. Wildlife was my company. Deer flicked through underbrush while hawks scrawled circles on blue canvases overhead. Then came day forty-seven, muggy and hushed, like the forest was holding its breath. The routine crackle of my radio erupted into a scream, a sound that wasn't quite animal yet less than human. It ground through the frequency with such ferocity that I hesitated before responding. The voice, garbled and pained, pleaded for help near Devil's Gulch. Forestry training kicked in over gut reactions. Horror stories don't save lives. Boots thudding down the watchtower steps, I entered a shifting maze where light played tricks between trunks. My search was methodical amid nature's indifference. The hairs on my arms stood despite the heat, a cliché of a feeling, but genuine. Whispers of movement drew my gaze repeatedly. It was almost imperceptible at first, a rustling, just ever so slightly discordant with the forest rhythm. I chalked it up to jitters until a blur darted into view, a fleeting glance of something man-shaped but wrong, contorted, its gait jerking and unnatural. A flash of light glinted off something metallic. My path converged on a clearing cut into nature's tapestry by force, where markings of an animal long gone mixed with detritus of human misdemeanor, a campsite turned graveyard. The initial shock dulled senses as I observed the remnants of three tents eviscerated like butchered carcasses, fabric sprayed as if in mid-explosion, belongings scattered. Detecting no survivors, or bodies, I shifted through torn screens and mangled poles until shreds of reality marred fantasy. Document fragments embossed with blurred legalese mentioned land rights and mining prospects. Vestiges of appetites insatiable encroaching upon wild domains. Treading deeper into wood spelled doom for most urban souls like Venus Gilroy or Soren Birch. Names I pieced together from identification spared by violence. But caution welded to duty road shotgun as unnatural sounds beckoned me forward. Talking myself through strategies to maintain sanity amid rising chills, regardless of sunbeams cascading overhead, I edged toward discordant noises clashing against nature's symphony. Humor fled as silhouettes flittered an unintelligible dance traversing tree lines. The radio static harried pleas turned to carnivorous hisses warning off interlopers with claims staked long before towers rose amongst pines. Time waned into evening's embrace. Shadows stretched like grasping fingers while truth danced just beyond sight. Its shape fluid but presence undeniable, a crime unraveling in whispers between leaves rustle. I clipped another frantic radio update while pursuing elusive prey not meant for human eyes. All conviviality devoured by tension coiling within sinews stretched taut by fear yoking sensibility. A crack of twig pierced silence. I froze. A form emerged, sinewy and quick. It moved with purpose and precision, 
edged closer. This creature, unseen before, stood upright yet hunched. Its skin, a patchwork of browns and greens as if trying to blend with forest tones. Muscles rippled beneath its surface, matted hair coiled around limbs that ended in formidable claws. I backed away, breath shallow. The creature advanced with menace, eyes locked onto me with unsettling focus. It lunged in a blur, tearing through the underbrush. I turned to run, a futile attempt to distance myself from the beast. Without a signal, my radio rendered useless by static since entering the woods. My only option was escape. Confrontation meant certain death. Each step forward sent twinges of pain through my ankle. I had stumbled in panic. The notion of calling for help dissolved in each labored breath that threatened to scream from my lungs. I heard its ragged breathing just paces behind me. I envisioned its jaws, dripping with anticipation of catching prey. A rending sound followed an intense pain shot through my shoulder as I fell forward. Life did not flash before my eyes. Instead a stark focus clung to survival alone. Gathering what strength remained, I crawled under fallen tree cover, hidden from view but not daring to believe myself concealed. Then silence. The anticipation it would reappear became torment in itself. Yet it did not come. Daylight waned and rescue arrived footsteps and voices cut the tension like a blade through cloth. They found me among the chaos alive but scarred, a tale cautionary then heroic unfolded for those who followed. Their search revealed two bodies. Venus Gilroy and Soren Birch had suffered fates similar preyed upon without mercy or reason by the creature now scurrying into dark myths whispered among rescuers. I carried their memory with me as a grim reminder of nature's indifferent balance between life and death. Days passed, recovery plagued by questions unanswered about the creature that hunted human flesh. Its origins left to speculation but reality lived deep within scars that crisscrossed my skin, truths accepted without understanding but forever altering perceptions of the wilds claiming both innocence and those who dared its depths. I still remember the first time I set eyes on the Gila National Forest, where I was assigned my new post as a fire lookout. The vast expanse of wilderness seemed both serene and secretive. My name, Silas Mercer, didn't matter much to the vastness around me. Up in the watchtower, perched like an eagle's nest amongst the emerald canopy, solitude was both a comfort and a curse. My days were rhythmic, scanning horizons for smokes or unnatural changes in the landscape. Communication with my only co-worker, Calliope Durand, was through crackled radio transmissions that filled the silence of my solitary existence. Calliope worked at another lookout tower in the distance. Her voice was often my only human connection. One uneventful morning turned sinister when a hiker's report brought me down from my perch. A mutilated bear found not too far from Boundary Creek had rangers buzzing with concern. Not an ordinary attack. It looked surgical, deliberate. Panic wasn't protocol, but unease seeped into our ranks. Days following the grisly find, I started observing subtle abnormalities in the forest. Flora trampled in unnatural patterns and wildlife unusually muted as if in dread of an unseen presence. Something, or someone, was turning this stretch of nature into their playground of terror. My routine patrol became a vigil, and each shadow flickering at night through the forest seemed to be skulking with motive. One particular evening as twilight melded into blackness, I caught a glimpse of something pacing at the edge of visibility not quite animalistic yet devoid of human grace. My chest constricted with alarm. This was no bear or wanderer but something else entirely, 
a dark silhouette stalking with intelligence and malice. A series of disappearances started to plague our community around that time, hikers vanishing without a trace. Local law enforcement stepped up their patrols, but nothing seemed amiss when they ventured through by daylight. It was only under the obscure shroud of night that fear took on its purest form. The radio became my lifeline then. Calliope's voice was tense but composed as we shared our observations in terse whispers. Movement near Ohito's Creek. Her voice broke through one night quivering slightly for the first time since I met her. With trepidation blanketing my reason, I ventured out one twilight under a pretext of routine, though nothing about that night felt habitual or calm anymore. Clutching a flashlight whose beam felt meager against the swallowing darkness, I moved towards Ohito's Creek. Shapes moved just beyond clarity among trees older than memory itself. Whether mind tricks or reality bending into horror did not matter then, I believed in the threat lurking among these ancient behemoths. The rustle of foliage underfoot seemed almost respectful as I paced. Nature itself appeared to be holding its breath alongside mine. Thudding footsteps interrupted the stillness behind me, calculated and quietly menacing in their approach. The lack of malice in their rhythm was more terrifying than any savage snarl could have been. Intelligence prowled behind each deliberated step closelier than comfort permitted. Clutching my radio for life's worth, I whispered into it hoarsely, I'm not alone. No response greeted me but an oppressively eerie silence enveloping me like mist coming down from the peaks around. In the silence that followed, I considered the radio dead. I couldn't call out. Whoever tracked me now surely listened. The steps grew near. I turned the flashlight off. In darkness I waited. A creature emerged, tall, angular, skin moonlit pale. No clothes it wore, no tools it held. Eyes wide, unblinking stared at me as it sniffed the air. I stood still. It cocked its head, a bird-like motion, then moved closer. Breath held, feet aching to flee, I watched as it stretched an arm toward me, fingertips ending in claws, not dagger sharp but like thorns of a wild bush. I dared not move as it touched my coat, recoiled almost instantly with a sound between a hiss and a groan. It circled me once, twice then backed away before turning and moving swiftly into the forest. Dawn was hours away. I made for the nearest town without looking back. Calliope and others had to know. After reaching safety and recounting my tale to the sheriff, search parties gathered. They found no one else that night. Days passed with no more vanishings. The creature I saw never appeared again in light or shadow. Others spoke of it only in hushed tones, half-belief tethered to fear. I stayed out of those woods from then on. My hikes ended. So did my nights by Ojitos Creek. The missing were not forgotten. We raised stones in their memory and avoided whispers of what might lurk beyond where paths end and raw wilderness begins, a fitting end to a warning unspoken amongst us all. I always enjoyed the calm that came with the early hours before sunrise. The trees stood still, and air held the scent of wet earth. My name is Tate Marlowe, a park ranger for Yellowstone, and I have walked these trails more times than I can count. This morning was different, though. A sense of disquiet clung to me like morning dew on grass. Making my way to where the underbrush thickens near Lewis River, I caught sight of an unusual disturbance. A swath of foliage was torn down in wide, consistent swaths that led into a thicket I knew well, one not taken by casual wildlife. This required investigation. Dangerous or not, it could spell trouble for hikers once the park filled with visitors. 
My radio crackled to life momentarily as I reported my location to dispatch. Headed into Lewis Thicket on account of some foliage damage. Might be a lost hiker or... I paused, considering the alternatives. Something else. They acknowledged with static lace voices. Delving deeper into the woods was routine, and yet today it felt fraught with unknowns. As light filtered through the pines, shadows seemed to dance with unnerving vigor. Then came peculiar marks on the ground, heavy imprints unlike any animal native to this region. Each step steeled my resolve. Being a ranger wasn't just about preserving nature but also confronting its rarer, more unpredictable aspects. An expanse of trees gave way to reveal that Lewis River had swelled overnight, its current robust and unforgiving. The far bank bore clear signs of something having emerged from the water, dragging with it clumps of sodden earth as it moved inland. This wasn't regular behavior for any creature around here. Just upstream lay remnants of what appeared to be clothing snagged on jagged rocks, ripped fabric that must have belonged to someone. Evidence pointed to an accident or criminal activity. In either case, silence wouldn't serve well so I radioed back to base requesting backup and detailing my findings concisely. Signs of possible human presence by Lemonade Creek Avoiding unwarranted speculation Trudging along the bank required focus. Every fiber and being was alert for signs of movement or distress calls from a potential survivor or perpetrator. Yet silence prevailed except for the rush of water and whistle of wind through boughs overhead. Curiosity pricked at me when motion at my periphery drew attention. There on a higher ridge, something stirred amongst the trees. A figure loomed where no man should stand so idly, especially not here in rough terrain unmarked by trails. The solitary shape surveyed the tree lean astutely and turned with deliberate slowness towards me without saying a word. Massive in size and obscured by branches, its silhouette betrayed no familiar form from Yellowstone's catalogue of residents. Bipedal yet broad-shouldered with limbs elongated grotesquely and skin that appeared rough-hewn from stone itself. As we locked gaze across distance and unspoken questions hung heavily between us like fog upon cold air, its presence became overwhelmingly intimidating without even moving closer nor making sound. Beside me lay sprawled remnants and detritus left behind by hikers or something more unsettling? Mind raced, but protocol reigned supreme. Observe first, then act upon reliable information only. Drawing out my sidearm provided little comfort against what intuition screamed as a being not felled by bullets alone, and considering those clothes shredded upon sharp Montana rock. No clear motive came to mind aside from one genuinely disturbing thought. Something picked people off paths less traveled here in greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Then suddenly and unnervingly close whispers broke through tranquil forest ambience the inevitable consequence of many sudden disappearances here. Perhaps signaled atrocities committed away from prying eyes humanity pledges protection over? I stepped back, heart pounding with the need to flee. Yet, feet planted firmly as if roots of the nearest pine bound me to the spot. Sidearm in hand, I understood its futility against what loomed above. The figure moved with an unnerving grace for its size. It descended the ridge with intent and purpose. Heavy footsteps were soft on the needle-covered ground, each step deliberate. A cry for help sat heavy on my tongue stifled by the sheer improbability of my situation. Rangers were minutes away, yet those minutes meant little against such odds. Help would arrive too late. The creature stopped a mere few yards away. Sunlight broke through leaves to unveil its features and fragments. Eyes sunk in deep sockets and stone-hewn skin stared with intelligence that belied animal instinct alone. Claws replaced fingertips unsuitable for human craft yet perfect for rending flesh with ease. It stalked forward, 
movements rippling muscle under tough skin. Without a word, it lunged across the clearing towards a doe feeding obliviously nearby. Its precision was terrifying as claws met hide, audible tear of life from bones shaking me from paralysis. I backpedaled instinctively but held ground enough to witness aftermath from a safe distance. Creature and prey faded into dense brush leaving behind evidence of the encounter. I made haste to safety once sinew stopped twitching from dissipating adrenaline's hold. Bound for ranger headquarters, voice trembled over radio calls relaying just enough detail to prepare colleagues without sowing disbelief. They found me huddled by patrols full of disbelief and questions I could not answer but relayed facts only size, movements, location precise as any ranger's report required. Days turned and query continued from voices somber with respect for lost park denizens known and unknown. They searched for trails left by something they still struggled to comprehend existed. I had no doubt it did. My experience spread through dispatches. Caution held paramount over sensational rumor. Teams moved carefully through while we pledged stewardship over. Evidence surfaced soon enough. Remains confirmed what foretold by previous tales of elusive terror marring Yellowstone's majestic tableau. Something ancient resided within untouched boundaries we thought known. And so life moved on in wary symbiosis with nature's reminder of our tentative place within it we observe, protect but never fully understand every secret held deep in heartland forests where giants tread silently amidst boughs overhead. I always found solace in the dense canopies of Holly Ridge Forest, where the chatter of wildlife was the soundtrack to my solitude. My name is Arlen Evett. As a park ranger, I've roamed these woods for years, long enough to know each trail like the back of my hand. An unusual call broke the symphony of nature one muted morning, a frantic voice on the radio speaking of a hiker gone missing. A thorough search commenced, our team combing through the gnarled underbrush and hidden gorges that ribboned across the terrain. Hours into our search, we stumbled upon a scene that hung heavy in the air. There, in a clearing seldom tread by foot, lay evidence of struggle, personal belongings scattered and dirt upheaved in desperation. No blood adorned the scene, yet an unease settled in my stomach a silent scream that no one else appeared to heed. As night unfurled its dark cloak over the forest, we decided to set up camp, unwilling to abandon hope or leave any stone unturned. Lowell Serio insisted on taking first watch. Sharp and meticulous by nature, Lowell had earned respect through unspoken trust. Cal Morfitt and Lita Garling slept beside the dying embers while I surveyed a map under dim torchlight, plotting our strategy for dawn. The quiet was our unwelcome companion until it was shredded by an abrupt rustle nearby. Lowell signaled us with urgency in his torch's flickering motion. We circled around to find tracks unlike any creature known to this part of the woods a harrowing mix of claw and dragged marks that told tales without words. Equipped only with our wits and whatever defense we bore against wild animals, we trailed this new lead with cautious steps. We hadn't bargained for what awaited us, structures fashioned not by any human hand, makeshift dens constructed from foliage and displaced earth. There it stood at the heart of convergence an entity shadowed by darkness itself, tall beyond natural reason, its limbs contorted at grotesque angles resembling tree roots reaching for sustenance. Its skin bore resemblance to rough bark while its eyes were wells of nothingness that seemed to absorb light itself. I remember holding my breath when it turned its gaze directly at me. No sound it made, just a silent understanding that something primal within me recognized fear beyond comprehension. An ear-piercing scream shattered our standstill, 
not one of us, but from somewhere deeper within the forest's core. Without word or plan, instincts took over as we scrambled towards the source, towards whoever may still be gasping for life amid these ancient guardians. We moved with fervor fueled by desperation. The forest air grew thick with anticipation as branches snapped beneath hurried footsteps and distant echoes wound their way through tree-lined paths. An electrifying pulse surged through my veins as I glimpsed the figure ahead not alone but ensnared by tendrils that seemed wrought from nightmare rather than nature. A shot rang out piercing silence before dissolving into nocturnal whispers. The scene swam before my senses. Lowell's hands steady despite tremors that suggested otherwise. Lita's voice cracked issuing commands rooted in strategy honed by firelit studies rather than sterile classrooms. Cal's silhouette blurred into action unseen but vital as threads within tapestry. Our unknown adversary moved with chilling purpose. No discernible pattern guiding its enigmatic hunt yet each motion spoke volumes about untold eons spent mastering such grim artistry enveloping weaving restraining without need for vulgar display or sound. Lowell kept firing. The echoes faded into quiet sobs. We asked why did he shoot. He said the vines moved. We saw nothing but thought the figure was a body. We found it lifeless. Lita checked for breath, for pulse, found none. It was Cal. I wanted to call for aid, but we had no signal deep in the woods. We decided to carry Cal back. The creature watched us. It loomed over Cal's body as if waiting. As we lifted Cal, I caught its form clearer than before bark-like skin merging with the trees, eyes deep cavities luring light away. It stood tall, wide, an entity of raw horror. Lita ordered movement. We obeyed without thought, moving with haste and dread. The creature followed noiselessly. Branches seemed to bend towards us, our path disappearing, redirected by an unseen force. We lost our way in panic. Sounds from the forest grew unnatural. Branches cracked behind us we ran without looking back. We reached a clearing under moonlight. Not far now from camp and from there to town. We laid Cal down gently on the ground as Lowell kept watch on the perimeter that was barely discernible under the failing moonlight. The rifle his constant companion during those moments of unprotected vulnerability. In silence and darkness we moved every creak and rustle magnified by our fear. Finally, a sight for sore eyes, lights from our campsite greeted us. Lita used her sat phone. Rescue was on its way now. The sun rose when they came for us and for Cal. In daylight, the forest seemed less menacing yet we knew better now. This was no ordinary place. Interviews followed. Rangers confused by our story which ebbed away in surreal fragments under their scrutiny. The creature remained out there somewhere beyond human reach or understanding, not beast nor man but something in between, otherworldly yet bound to these woods which held secrets ancient as time itself. We learned nothing of its kind as it vanished with the passing night only leaving behind the tragic loss of Cal who we remembered for his courage and friendship. Later I would sit alone thinking of that night when fear ruled and shadows moved where they should not, a memory fixed in place never to be unraveled by reason or logic. I've always found solace on the open road a place where my thoughts run free and the landscapes blur into a medley of colors as I haul loads from coast to coast. My name is Amos Braxley, and I'm no stranger to long hours behind the wheel of my rig. My route that day took me through the desolation of Nevada's backcountry, a seemingly lifeless corner of the world where civilization felt like a distant memory. As I drove through an area known more for its ghost towns than its living inhabitants, 
I decided to make a stop at Eldridge Service Station, a rusty speck on the map. It was long past due for me to stretch my legs and chow down on whatever prepackaged meal they had in stock. The air hung heavy with the smell of dusty asphalt mixed with the tang of old fuel pumps, a smell oddly comforting in its familiarity. Inside the station's convenience store, the shelves were half-stocked with goods that seemed to have outlived their shelf life. Behind the counter stood Sly Stanton, a man whose presence was as gaunt as the barren shelves. Sly managed a gruff nod in my direction as I grabbed a sandwich, offering up a joke about hoping it didn't date back to the disco era. The smile it pulled from his weathered face was grim but genuine. Back outside... I leaned against the warm metal of my truck while savoring what turned out to be a surprisingly decent sandwich given its questionable origin. That's when I saw him, a figure standing motionless at the edge of the lot. A chill swept over me despite the heat radiating from every surface around me. The man was dressed in a plain brown jacket despite the sweltering heat, a detail that registered as odd in my mind. His face was obscured by shadows that seemed deeper than they had any right to be given the harsh noon sunlight overhead. Despite his distance, I could make out features weathered and worn, eyes shielded beneath an unkempt fringe of dark hair. I tried convincing myself this was just another weary traveler or some drifter wandering through, but in these empty quarters, you learn not to shrug off your gut feeling, something was wrong. Returning to my truck with haste that betrayed my inner alarm, I reassumed my journey determined to put distance between myself and Eldridge Service Station before nightfall. Thoughts churned as miles slipped beneath my tires. Distress calls seemed pointless with cellular signals here stretching thinner than watered-down coffee. The radio was little comfort. Distorting voices attempting to reach through static offered only fragments of conversations that left much too much room for imagination's dark ponderings. It wasn't until a few hours later when fatigue weighed heavily on my eyelids that necessity dictated another stop at what appeared to be an abandoned warehouse near an old mining operation, the kind you hear stories about but never quite believe exist. With reluctance etched into each step, I prepared myself for a few hours of shut-eye parked beside crumbling concrete and forgotten history. Sounds eroded away into silence as twilight stretched long shadows over still mining equipment, the collective quiet broken occasionally by the subtle groans and shifts typical of settling structures or perhaps something else lurking just beyond sight and sense. Yet it was not until darkness truly fell that unease blossomed into dread, a sense that someone watched from just beyond where light dared penetrate. Peering into mirrors revealed only night's embrace. However, there hung an unshakable certainty. Eyes were trained upon me with intent hidden yet palpably malignant. Then came rustlings, subtle yet undeniable. Invasive noises scratching against solitude's veil and inching ever closer under cover of darkness till heartbeats matched tempo with tingling nerves. I sat tense, alert to every noise from inside the car, each creak a potential harbinger of what lurked outside. The decision not to call for help was both practical and regrettable. My phone showed no signal a common plight in such remote areas where even the most reliable networks failed. Time felt distorted, slow and thick like molasses, and silence hung heavy around me. Then, a sudden loud clatter against the metal door broke through the fragile stillness. My heart raced but my body froze. Action seemed impossible. A shadow moved outside, tall and broad-shouldered, just beyond the reach of my headlights. The figure paced back and forth. Breaths came in short, sharp bursts revealing more about the presence. It was male, large, its silhouette outlined by the weak moonlight. I glimpsed a hand, a hand too large to be considered normal, with fingers that ended in what seemed like abnormally thickened tips. 
though it was hard to make out details in the dim light. I could see he was dressed unremarkably, jeans and a plain jacket. He stopped pacing and stood still for a moment before advancing toward me menacingly. He slammed a fist on the hood of my car. The sound echoed through the silent mining equipment surrounding us, the thud of intent. Metal groaned under his strength. Then, without warning or reason, he withdrew to the darkness again. The assault on my senses left me paralyzed. Inaction was my refuge in rationalizing that this confrontation couldn't be real. This must be some sort of misunderstanding. But logic proved insufficient as he returned with something long and metallic in his hand. It gleamed under what little light seeped through the clouds. A crowbar or a tire iron, perhaps. My palms sweated as I gripped the steering wheel tighter. The window shattered first, glass flying into the car like cruel rain pouring down on me, the sound deafening in the compact space. He reached inside with his huge hand, but I ducked away just in time, avoiding contact. He never uttered a word through it all, his silence more alarming than any threat spoken aloud could ever be. The situation grew dire and escapism seemed my only strategy left. I turned on the car as quickly as possible amidst my shaking hands fumbling with keys and pushed down hard on the accelerator without looking back at what lay behind or whom. Old equipment rattled in protest as I maneuvered around them, their ghostly figures condemning as if they knew escape is only temporary relief from such encounters. I found myself back on familiar roads soon enough yet didn't stop driving until lights of civilization greeted me a gas station's neon sign acting as a beacon after such unspeakable darkness. With daylight came law enforcement, officials piecing together events from tattered explanations I managed between breaths still reflecting shock. They checked their records, but nothing tangible emerged about him, no one fitting such description known to lurk near mining sites or anywhere nearby. Remorse weighed heavy for not seeing his face clearer, to give something more substantial than just details of size and unspoken intimidation. Days passed. I healed from scrapes while glass got replaced, but echoes from that night stayed with me, a reminder of fragility within silence and solitude. As reports came through of similar incidents, of others less fortunate who met him, it dawned upon me. He might be known only by assumption, by attributes rather than name, the silent giant perhaps, the moniker summing up all we feared yet knew little about this man who moved through shadows with inexplicable violence ingrained within him, leaving trails stained red for others to mourn those lost, and for those spared by fortunate twists of fate, to begin processing what transpired, always, wondering why. Yet amidst grieve lay resolve, not allowing fear to reign supreme. Understanding dark encounters breed resilience for whatever may wait ahead, even if it lurks just beyond where light dares penetrate. I've always prided myself on being grounded in reality but reality has a way of becoming malleable under certain circumstances. My name is Clovis Penrose, a truck driver by trade, and the open road was where I sought solace from life's relentless complexities. The solitude behind the wheel was my sanctuary until one particular route undid that peace. I was making my usual cross-country haul to an unremarkable little town called Oak Ridge, nestled deep within the tall, foreboding trees of the Oregon backwoods. The cargo, a collection of industrial parts bound for a local manufacturer, was mundane yet necessary. The day began as any other. Coffee was not part of my ritual. Instead, a cold splash of water and two fried eggs were enough to start the engine of my day. 
I left behind the city's humdrum and made my way into less inhabited territories where houses were miles apart, and cell reception was nothing more than a wishful thought. The anonymity of these places appealed to me, no strings or expectations, just transient interactions. Engines have a language of their own, a mixture of hums and hisses that speak to those who listen carefully. So when my truck began to protest with a series of clanks completely foreign to my ears, I knew trouble wasn't far behind. Ignoring the persistent voice of caution in my head, I pushed onward until smoke billowed from under the hood like an unwelcome genie offering no wishes, only misfortune. Stranded and alone with only pines for company, I popped open the hood. Mechanical knowledge wasn't among my virtues, yet one look at the engine told me it wasn't something I could mend with duct tape or sheer willpower. There was no soul around for miles. Silence reigned, save for the whispering whine through the trees. A passing vehicle was an unlikely godsend in these neglected parts. Hence my feet begrudgingly became my transport. A small service station on this forgotten road appeared on an old map like a relic from bygone days. I could only hope time hadn't swallowed it whole. As the sun played hide and seek amongst the treetops casting long shadows that began their evening stretch, I finally caught sight of that old service station, Fenwick Repair and Fuel a decaying monument to optimism and neglect's embrace. The bell above the door announced my arrival with far too much enthusiasm for such a desolate place. Inside was untouched by corporate hands, grease-stained floors married to shelves lined with products whose packaging had faded with age, a mausoleum of sorts for automotive necessities. Standing behind the counter was a hulk of a man whose size seemed an odd companion to his silent demeanor, his face half-hidden under a baseball cap's shadow, eyes obscured by dirt-smeared spectacles perched precariously on his nose. The job didn't require many words. Truck broke down, I said. About three miles back. He nodded once. Not a man wasted on pleasantries or unnecessary movements. But action followed soon after as he collected some tools and grunted, signaling me to lead the way. Silence made itself known once more as we walked to where my unfaithful mechanical beast lay resting amongst nature's giants. A murmur escaped me about family back home, something relatable, to pierce that quietude surrounding us like thick fog but his reply never came. Our only verbal exchange dissipated like breath in cold air. Then came his inspection, thorough, the sort that makes you believe in craftsmanship. But something wasn't right about him, about this whole ordeal. His gaze too often wandering off into thick foliage as if anticipating an unwelcome guest or maybe watching one already present. Suddenly distant shouts permeated through still air a sonorous cry for help that clawed at primal instincts toward empathy or self-preservation, perhaps. A motorist may be another broken-down victim put paid by neglect or sabotage. We set forth hastily towards those calls but stopped dead when we stumbled upon remnants of desperation, personal effects scattered careless blood-stained garments painting violent tales upon nature's canvas carnage concealed within deceptive beauty. We continued on, past the scattered belongings and crimson hues that interrupted the forest floor. An oppressive silence took hold, a stark contrast to the urgency that had gripped us moments ago. The man I'd followed from the gas station moved with stealth, his eyes scanning the environment with a predator's focus. He motioned for me to stop, and I complied without question. The sounds had ceased. Whatever or whoever called out was now silent. We stood, hearts pounding, waiting for a sign of what to do next. His hand rose slowly, forefinger extended. He'd spotted something. Movement flickered through the trees, a figure slipping between trunks and shadows. The man from the station stepped forward with quiet resolve, 
tools of repair still clutched in his grasp. I noticed then how they could serve more violent purposes if required. Our unwelcome companion showed himself, broad-shouldered, imposing height, his hair ragged and wild against his dirt-smudged face. Eyes empty of humanity locked on to ours with chilling resolve. He bore no weapon but his bare hands, tools enough for one well-versed in unleashing harm. Tension crackled like kindling before a flame. The stranger charged without sound, a blur of fury aimed squarely at us. The mechanic met him first, steel wrench swinging in an arc too fast for eyes to follow, a futile effort against brute force undeterred by injury or pain. A sharp pain erupted in my side as I stumbled away, flesh giving way to unplanned violence. My eyes found the mechanic overcome by our attacker's relentless assault, worrying motion stilled into finality. The will to save myself overpowered shock, pavement underfoot as I ran towards civilization within sight but still too far for comfort. Breath ragged, blood seeping warmth down my side, I would legs unsteady from fear and loss to keep moving. I pushed through the door of a diner some miles down, collapsing into arms that pulled me to safety behind locked doors and hasty calls to law enforcement conveyed with urgency that bordered on panic. The hours that followed were fragments, uniforms, questions I struggled to answer through haze and hurt, lights too bright against walls antiseptic in their cleanliness compared to woods left behind. In those moments when reality ebbed and flowed around me on currents of painkillers and disbelief, Two truths emerged. The mechanic was no more. His name unknown to me even at the end, and our aggressor remained at large amidst taunting silence his parting scornful gift. Days turned within hospital gray until discharge papers returned me to a world altered by violence's random draw. News reports spoke of search parties and an investigation hampered by nature's vastness versus man's limited reach. The mechanic's fate became mentioned whispers amongst townsfolk, mourned loss tethered forever to warning tales cautions voice amongst those who remembered blood marring earth's browns and greens. I drove past my abandoned truck once engines worked at human command again, left it untouched where it had failed me, a relic best left alone, symbolic of day's innocence took its leave without farewell nor intent ever returned. There's something universally unsettling about the notion that we don't really know what lurks in the untamed parts of the world the dense forests and remote landscapes where nature still reigns. That feeling clung to me as I drove into the heart of the Appalachian foothills, to a place that even Google Maps hesitated to pinpoint accurately. I'm Cleary, Garland Cleary a biologist formally contracted by a private wing of U.S. government for some particularly sensitive work. Tucked between the folds of mist-shrouded greenery was our site, Station Echo, a clandestine facility devoted to genetic experiments that pushed the boundaries of conventional science. My colleagues, none with household names, shared my expertise in cloak and dagger lifestyle. There was Myron Stubbs, a bioengineer with more affinity for lab rats than people, Elsie Crump, our cross-disciplinary scientist whose eclecticism matched her name, and Beulah Varnado, Dr. Varnado, an authority on gene editing who could splice DNA sequences as easily as she did conversation. Our task that morning seemed routine, verification of sample integrity from our latest field retrieval. The samples in question were far from ordinary. They were fragments of DNA sourced from indigenous species, reputed for their extraordinary regenerative capabilities. But just as Myron piped up with one of his peculiar jests, something about coding lab mice to sing baritone, our radar array flickered erratically before blanking out completely. 
A commotion outside tore us from our screens. Instinctively, we moved as one, Myron arming himself with a shotgun we kept in case of bears or other wildlife encounters while I grabbed a radio. Station Echo stood surrounded by forests so dense, sunlight seemed like an outsider struggling to make itself known. Outside, the trees heaved in restless whispers as if cautioning us against venturing further. We fanned out across the clearing near our satellite dish. Evidence wasn't long coming. A disconcerting splatter of red contrasted sharply against the verdant underbrush. It's Mercer, Elsie breathed. Her assertion fell unargued as we recognized Donald Mercer's fire-red jacket torn and bloodied among scattered pages of his field notes. Donald had been surveying a swathe of traverse terrain alone this morning. Few words were exchanged. Some things are better communicated with nods and set jaws rather than words. We knew we had to find Donald, or what was left of him. An animal attack? Possibly. Males in mating season get ornery around these parts. The woods felt stranger. Familiar trails appeared distorted and shadows stretched greedily towards us, as though trying to swallow us whole into obscurity. We called Mercer's name into the void expecting no response, and received none apart from echoing silence clawing back at us through thickets and thorns. As daylight waned, it became increasingly hard to disregard an intrinsic primal anxiety. One doesn't work in isolated environments without accruing eerie tales, stories shared over drinks or used to spook newbies about creatures that were shaped by nightmare and folklore rather than evolution and ecology. Beulah furrowed her brow at something caught on her boot, a tuft of fur matted with a substance I hoped was mud. It seemed deliberate, like breadcrumbs leading Hansel and Gretel astray. Yet amid this high-strung tension Beulah offered an aloof quip about Mother Nature's lackluster sense of humor that bolstered enough courage to laugh in discomfort. Then paid dirt. Up ahead lay overturned soil scarring the earth's flesh. A struggle here had taken place. Mercer's footprints danced in panic alongside strangely elongated impressions intermittently punctuating the earth with claw-like assertions, evidence merging superstition with stark reality. Skepticism dissolved every step took into newfound unease as twilight bled into nighttime's domain. We kept close knowing separation equated vulnerability, a stark reminder when Elsie stumbled upon more signs of violence. Broken branches adorned crudely with strips resembling human attire. The radio crackled then failed right when Myron muttered about its damn reliability, but I caught movement, a fleeting shadow undulating between tree lines, a typical even for this floor-rich heartland where daylight seemed reluctant to explore thoroughly. Myron and Elsie regrouped. The radio was useless. The shadow we caught— nothing but a flicker now, had vanished. We moved toward the disturbed soil where the struggle took place. The claw marks were deep, more profound than any animal native to these woods. Beulah clutched her weapon tight, her gaze fixed on the tree line. Should we go back? Elsie whispered. Beulah shook her head. Phones won't catch a signal here. We pushed to the ranger station. It's our best bet. Our group inched forward. Stick straight paths gave way to aimless wanderings of desperate footprints. Then scattered leaves marked a burst of motion where somebody, possibly Mercer, ran for life. Thuds broke through the silence around us, methodical, gaining in volume, and with every snap of twig under unseen weight, the reality dug its claws deeper into our minds. Myron signaled us to stop, a quiet command he whispered with an edge of command. There, I pointed near a thicket where movement stirred once more. Out stepped the creature, an irregularity against nature, an abomination of limbs and tooth. Its eyes held no discernible emotion as it advanced. None dared fight. Fleeing was instinctual, 
the forest exploded into chaos as each of us split against logical thought. I heard screams not far off, Elsie's or Beulah's. I couldn't tell. Myron was nowhere. Lost in this maze, all communication severed by dread that descended quick and thick. I stumbled over roots and felt hot breaths close behind with each frantic step until sunlight broke through the dense overhang. A building loomed, the ranger station silhouetted against dawn's early light. Slamming the door shut behind me gave fleeting refuge. Panting breaths became sobs, not mine. A ranger's voice reached out from under a desk in frightful mutters of things seen yet not believed. We waited. With daylight came rescuers searching for screams heard in the dark they stumbled upon pieces unidentifiable yet human all evidence pointing to Mercer and Elsie, victimized by something unnatural from folklore never mentioned nor understood by me until now. Days later tracks led trackers back empty-handed. Speculations filled the gaps left by absence and silence filled homes once echoing Elsie's laughter and Mercer's banter only memories remained etched into hearts that endured scarred forever by gashes deeper than any left in earth's flesh from claws that night. Claws belonging to what I could only assume was real despite all logic I held dear prior to this ordeal. An ordeal ending now with whimper rather than bang as creature vanished as quick as... It arrived leaving behind only horror-filled nights under watchful moonlight thereafter. There's something universally unsettling about the deep, almost sentient murk of an old forest when dusk begins to blur the lines between tree and shadow. That's where my story took its grim turn a tale that squirms uncomfortably in one's memory long after it's been told. I work for the government. My name is Eustace Harrow. Our lab, a clandestine facility neatly tucked away in the sprawling woods of northern Maine, specializes in genetic experiments that aren't meant for public knowledge. My colleague, Jasper Quillen, and I were used to the solitude our work afforded us. Jasper had this quirk where he'd make light of our isolation with a joke that never failed to be both terrible and amusing. If a scientist mutates a frog in the forest, and no one is around to hear it rib bit three octaves lower, does it make a sound? The joke not only broke up the monotony but reminded us of our silent agreement. We were alone out here. Help wasn't an option. Jasper was right. No sane ear would ever catch wind of any mishap that befell us. One early morning, just as the first hint of light nudged at the horizon, we discovered something truly abhorrent near one of our perimeter fences, a deer, or at least what was once a deer. It had been torn open, organs festooned like grotesque bunting from branch to branch. It wasn't predators. Maine had its share of wildlife, but this— this was something else. As we stood there rigid with shock over this grisly scene, Jasper murmured dryly, Well, at least we know whatever did this isn't vegan. His attempt at humor fell flat against the stark horror before us. The day lapsed into evening as dread pooled silently in our stomachs with each darkening minute. We should have made more noise about it. Yet somehow calling in such a finding seemed worse than dealing with it in hushed tones among ourselves. Perhaps we were worried about disbelievers or those worse yet who'd believe all too easily. It was nearing midnight when strange noises encroached upon our small cluster of buildings. Stepping outside into the crisp air, flashlight in hand and pistol holstered at my side, a precaution more for peace of mind than practicality. I scanned the looming tree lean for any sign of movement. What met my eyes was an abomination tethered to nightmare and folklore, the stuff rural legends warn you about on stormy nights, but you never expect to confront. Its form slipped between human and beast, 
a perversion adorned with antlers that nodded into wicked points like crowns forged for a king among grotesqueries. Its movements were deliberate and silent, unnervingly so, as if every step was calculated for quiet malice. This was no creature I knew or had read about, not a bear or wolf, and it defied explanation yet demanded acknowledgment from its sheer presence alone. And there I stood frozen, not from fear alone but from incredulity, as my rational mind stuttered to make sense of what should not exist outside whispered campfire tales designed merely to chill young blood. Jasper burst through the lab door, huffing out his disbelief laced with panic-tinted vigor echoing my own internal pandemonium. Eustace! What in God's name! His voice trailed off as he too caught sight of that eldritch sentinel glaring coldly back at us from beyond civilization's well-lit boundaries. The thing moved closer with intent. Its eyes bore intelligence a disturbing hint of cunning that sent alarms flaring through every fiber of my being, and with each step closer it appeared more otherworldly yet distressingly corporeal. I drew my gun, a feeble gesture against such an entity, but its metallic click provided a momentary veneer of control amidst this chaos churning reality into a twisted mythos. Suddenly Jasper cried out as something barbed and wet struck across his chest. An appendage unseen launched from our would-be predator cloaked in night's sable robes. Jasper dropped to the floor, clutching his chest. Blood soaked through the fabric of his shirt, where the creature's limb had struck him. I froze for a split second then grabbed Jasper's arm and pulled him back. Into the lab, away from the creature that stood in the doorway. We slammed the door shut and I locked it. Call 911, I shouted as Jasper winced, pressing his hand against the wound. We heard a thud against the door. The creature clearly was not deterred by closed doors. I grabbed my phone but there was no signal, a common issue in our remote research lab that I never thought twice about until now. A landline hung on the wall beside us. It was dead too. We were cut off. The door shook again under another powerful blow from the creature. Its exact features were indiscernible in the darkness, but I could make out large eyes reflecting light and limbs that ended in sharp points, tools for hunting and hurting. We moved away from the door, pain evident in Jasper's movements. The lab was modest, filled with benches, cabinets, and heavy machinery. It lacked hiding spaces or weapons useful against such an antagonist. The creature hammered against the door again. Cracks began to form on its surface. Jasper pointed toward an emergency exit at the back of the lab, a door we rarely used. It led further into unlit hallways but away from this immediate threat. We made for that exit as quietly as we could move. Behind us, the laboratory door splintered under relentless attacks. It wouldn't hold much longer. Through twisted hallways we went until we emerged outside into cold night air. A car parked nearby became our goal. The creature might follow, but we had to risk it for a chance at escape and survival. Reaching the vehicle, I fumbled with keys while Jasper stumbled against it, weak from blood loss and pain. The car unlocked. We climbed inside and I ignited the engine as we heard a screech from within the building, a siren call of frustration or perhaps hunger from our pursuer. We drove down winding roads that led away from our nightmare. Our only focus was to reach help for Jasper and alert authorities about whatever resided back at our shattered sanctuary of research, a place now marked by horror. At a hospital hours later after uninterrupted driving, doctors took Jasper away on a gurney while concerned faces asked questions I struggled to answer without sounding mad. Jasper survived but bore scars that would forever remind us of that night when research gave way to hunt, when curiosity led not to wonder but a brush with death from a source still unknown yet, savagely real. 
Authorities searched our facility finding nothing but destruction and bloodstains. No sign of any intruder or animal known to local wildlife experts. They remain baffled. I find sleep elusive now. My mind revisits those moments often, and every shadow causes my heart to beat faster, fearing return of that which I hope never walks this earth again. This happened to me a few years back. At the time, I worked a soul-sucking corporate job with hours that left me little time for actual life. Sarah, my wife, convinced me I needed a vacation. I didn't agree. What were a few days away going to change? Still, after much nagging, I grudgingly put in for time off. Our travel options with such short notice were limited. Flights anywhere fun were exorbitant, but a couple named Blake and Amelia on an RV rental site were practically giving theirs away on short notice. I'd never driven that big of a vehicle, but it seemed easy enough. Sarah booked it before I could object further. Maybe some fresh air and time outdoors would be what I needed after all. Our destination was decided for us too. Blake and Amelia suggested Sequoia National Park in California. They offered glowing references, stunning trails, towering trees, the whole bit. And the idea of spending time near those gargantuan sequoias did pique my interest. It promised to be something unique. I'm Evan, by the way. We picked up the RV on a scorching summer afternoon. Inside was nicer than I expected— all cozy and well-stocked. After a crash course from Blake on operation, we were hesitantly on our way. Sarah drove first. That alone took some edge off my tension. Sequoia was amazing. I admit, seeing those ancient, massive trees brought something close to all. We spent two days wandering trails, losing signal on our phones, cooking dinners outdoors on the little campsite stove. There was laughter. That felt weird. We were happy, or at least as close to it as I'd been in years. I started to understand what Sarah meant about finding myself again. My corporate worries slowly drifted away. Day three, that's when things turned. We'd tackled a strenuous hike early, returning to the campsite exhausted. I took over the wheel for the short trip to our next site while Sarah made lunch. About halfway there, I noticed the truck pulled off behind a grove of trees, maybe a quarter mile down the road. Nothing weird, right? People stop. But in the rearview mirror, I saw someone step out from behind those trees. Tall guy. Thin. Binoculars in his hands. At first, I thought he was a bird watcher. Then it hit me. Sarah was making sandwiches in the back. He couldn't see her. My gut twisted. Something wasn't right. Evan, the view up here is beautiful. Pull over. Sarah called out. My foot hesitated over the gas. That guy didn't feel like a bird watcher. Not the way he moved. Not the way he held the binoculars. I didn't answer Sarah, just pushed down harder on the accelerator. It wasn't much, but I was glad the RV had some pickup. My hands clenched the wheel tight. Evan? Why aren't you, oh God? Sarah had spotted him too in the side mirror. Panic set in. A mile past our turn, there was a small rest area. I skidded into it, my heart pounding against my ribs. We slammed the doors shut, locking them in a single motion. Sarah huddled up against me, and we could feel rather than see his truck rumble past. He didn't stop. We stayed there, breathless, for what felt like hours. He wasn't after us, I told myself. Just a coincidence. He wasn't coming back but my mouth was dry with fear. That night, 
Sarah and I barely slept. Every creak of the RV, every rustling branch, put us on edge. I wished I'd brought a gun, or learned hand-to-hand combat, hell, anything to feel something less than helpless. Sarah kept asking if we should head home, and a voice told me she was right. Yet a stubborn defiance, and the guilt of ruining her long forgetaway, kept me from agreeing. Next morning, everything was unnaturally still. The air buzzed with wrongness. I had this sick feeling in my gut, a certainty that he was out there, watching us, just waiting. I finally agreed to drive, my grip on the steering wheel so tight my knuckles went white. At the first ranger station, we burst in, desperate to report what happened. Their faces were a strange mix of confusion and pity. You see folks disappear. Happens every year, the older ranger said with a resigned sigh. People, sometimes they want to start fresh elsewhere, or they think they can live off the land with no plan. Some accidents out there, too. Terrain gets rough. But we saw. Sarah tried to argue, then trailed off. Of course, they wouldn't believe us. It sounded crazy, and frankly, I was starting to have my doubts about how real yesterday even was. Stress can play tricks on the mind. This happened to me a couple of years back, right around that time in life when weekend getaways with the guys just started feeling routine, you know? Still fun, but less of an adventure. Name's Noah, by the way. Used to be a bit of a city rat, noisy apartment, take out every night, till work stressed me out so bad I had to make a change. Got into hiking, biking, all that healthy nature stuff. Figured why not try an actual camp out for once? My buddy Declan, bless his adventurous spirit, found this awesome website claiming to list undiscovered camping spots. The one that caught our eye was a secluded clearing deep in the Ozarks, Missouri side, near a winding river. No crowds, no park rangers, no nothing. Just us and the open skies. Sounded too good to be true to this city boy, but I was up for it. It was a long drive in Declan's beat-up old RV, packed full of supplies. It took longer than we thought to get to the remote access road, and even by then, the sun was fading fast. Should have called it a night right there, but the call of the wild and all that. There was a rough clearing just barely big enough for the RV, surrounded by these gnarled pine trees. Didn't take long to set up camp, a few folding chairs, basic supplies out. Declan insisted on messing with his telescope while there was still some light. Me, I wanted to push ahead, do some exploring. The website mentioned a trail system nearby. It's funny how quickly ambition fades when the light disappears and the woods loom over you. That's when I started to think maybe staying near the RV wouldn't be so bad. Declan laughed at me, but even he must have felt it, that nagging chill that wasn't the evening air. I head off down a worn path, phone flashlight flickering uselessly against the trees. Shouldn't have gone solo, should have waited for daylight, but that familiar craving for a little exploration got the better of me. That thrill of being away from it all, from work, routine, noise, people. The first half hour goes fine, just the gentle creaks you expect from the forest. And then, I see it. At first, it's just a lean-to propped against a massive oak, but there's something off about it. Fabric too old and worn for any modern camper, branches propped too tight against the tree like it was built as a makeshift shelter and left untouched for ages. That's when it hits me, an iron tang in the air, the stench of rotting meat. There are clothes strewn across the ground, tattered and muddy, 
some soaked in dark splotches I don't even want to imagine. And right next to that makeshift camp, something large, wrapped in ripped dark canvas, something still. I should have run then, called for Declan, anything. But there's a morbid curiosity burning within me, the need to figure out what the hell happened here. I inch closer, phone beam catching at the canvas tarp, and that's when I notice the boots peeping out. Now, this is where my brain and body disagree. The sensible part yells, Get out of there! The other part just freezes. Can't speak, can't move. It's as if every part of me knows there's danger nearby, but my fear is too overwhelming to do anything except stand there gawking. The boots don't budge. There's no breathing, not even the rise and fall of a chest. Finally, something clicks. That body was dead for sure, the smell overpowering now. Something, or someone, left him and whatever other poor souls set up camp here to rot. My mind races through all the stories I'd heard about folks mysteriously disappearing in national parks, and suddenly I am running through those trees, legs screaming, flashlight bobbing wildly. It feels like it takes forever, but then I see the glimmer of our campsite ahead. I burst through the trees, yelling for Declan. I stop short. He's staring through his telescope, perched on his camping chair like nothing is wrong. You gotta see this, Noah, he points upward. Orion's right. Suddenly, he notices the wild look in my eyes. I gasp, trying to get words out, and point wildly back at the trees. Declan finally jumps off his chair, confused. Then, from what felt like right behind us, comes a blood-curdling scream. It's not human, and it's definitely not an animal I've ever heard. There's a rustling nearby, snapping branches, something moving at impossible speed. We both just stare, paralyzed. There's another scream, and in a flash, Declan turns and bolts for the RV. My body finally kicks into gear and I run right behind him. No fancy plan, just a desperate scramble into that rickety RV. I barely make it through the door before I hear a thump against the side, metal groaning, followed by that screech again. Declan slams the gas pedal, lurching us backwards enough to throw me on the floor. My head hits hard against the cabinet, blurring my vision for a second. It takes every ounce of strength to pull myself up. When I can finally focus, I see Declan peering frantically out the windshield. I scramble beside him, and we both gasp at the same time. There's a man standing near the edge of the clearing, tall, emaciated, and clothes barely hanging off him. His skin seems gray in the faint moonlight, and his eyes, they glow an unnerving amber color, fixed on the RV. It's hard to make out details through the streaked glass, but there's something unsettlingly animalistic about the way he hunches, almost predatory. It's like he knows we're looking, senses us staring with absolute terror. I hear a scratch against the door, fingernails or something else sharp and bony. Another horrifying scream echoes through the woods. Then... Declan's shaking hands manage to put the RV in gear and he guns it out of there, tires spitting dirt and gravel. My head swims, blood trickling from where I hit the cabinet, but I don't dare take my eyes off that terrifying figure in the flickering headlights. He doesn't give chase, just stands there watching us, perfectly still as we speed off into the dark. For a terrifying moment... I think maybe we're safe after all. We managed to make it back to the rough access road, where that sliver of civilization brings me some small shred of hope. Then, from somewhere in the dense trees beside the road, the screaming starts again. There's another loud shriek, and we hear a crash just moments before something massive leaps onto the roof of the RV, metal screeching, fiberglass crunching. Declan swerves madly, 
nearly tipping us into the ditch. Whatever it is on our roof, it's heavy, clawing at us, ripping into the vehicle like a starving animal. We don't stop, I barely even take a breath. Declan floors it, tires spinning and kicking up mud. There are thuds against the sides, bone against metal, more of those inhuman cries slicing through the night. I try to look back, see what's attacking us, but the forest flashes past too quickly in the dim light. The RV starts to fill with an awful stink, the same rotting smell from the campsite. Finally, after what feels like forever, we hit the main road. It feels like freedom. Like maybe, just maybe, we made it out. We don't slow down until we see the lights of a highway rest stop, and only then do we dare to pull over. The damage to the RV is extensive, deep scratches running the length of it, windows cracked and leaking. My heart throbs at the idea of what we barely escaped. We barely speak until we find a gas station and stumble inside to call the police. They don't find anything out there, except some ravaged campsites and scattered personal effects. The look on the officers' faces speaks louder than words. After that, the drive home is a blur. Neither of us really want to talk about what we saw. Every dark shadow along the highway sparks the same terror. Even after I shower and lie awake in my own bed, I imagine the smell following me. Imagine those glowing eyes burning into me from the corner of my room. Declan doesn't respond to my texts or calls. The news whispers of missing locals, disappearances explained away vaguely as animal attacks. I know better. We both know better. It's become hard to find peace in the outdoors. I still take hikes, forced by some sense of routine, but I never stray far from the trail. There's a voice in the back of my head reminding me that darkness hides more than just unseen roots and unseen rocks. That somewhere out there, just beyond the edge of human understanding, that man and whatever attacked us still exist. The wild doesn't seem so adventurous anymore. I'm Walter, and this abandoned factory deep within the Minnesota forest is where my team and I find ourselves. We work for an elite task force whose sole purpose is to hunt and track monsters. I've seen things that would make most people question reality. My unit, consisting of me, Justine, Jakub, and Euphemia, had been called in to investigate a string of grisly murders plaguing the surrounding area. The locals had reported a creature stalking the woods, an amalgamation of skin and bone with piercing eyes and razor-like claws. While it's hard to believe in local myths, our experience tells us there's always some truth behind them. At first light, our investigation takes us through the towering trees cloaked in ethereal fog. The further we journey into the woods, the more unnerving it becomes— Fallen leaves conceal small holes in the ground which almost seem intentional. I miss my wife's cooking right now. Watch your step, Jakob exclaims as he narrowly avoids falling into one of these pits. Looks like something's been digging here. As we venture deeper into the forest, we notice horrific signs of violence. Partially eaten remains litter the ground, and foliage scarred by claw marks looms overhead. At each grisly scene, Euphemia carefully collects samples for analysis back at camp. Justine gives me an uneasy glance before keeping her eyes back on the path ahead. What do you make of this thing? Justine asks me as we scout our surroundings. Don't know yet, I reply skeptically. We'll discuss it during our debrief tonight. Whoever, or whatever is behind these deaths is methodical and intelligent. Later that evening, we hunker down near a natural clearing encircled by trees. That's when Euphemia presents her findings. 
bones stripped raw by something with molars accustomed to crushing through flesh and bone, she explains. Almost canine in nature, but far larger and more powerful. She points towards the saliva samples. These also show some kind of chemical. Its effects still need to be investigated. Our vigilance heightens as darkness blankets the woods around us. A necessary precaution when dealing with creatures capable of inflicting such carnage. As night falls and our nerves grow tense, roots seem to grasp at our ankles like skeletal fingers attempting to drag us into the earth. The wind carries whispers of something sinister lurking in every shadow. Circling the camp, Justine notices deeply gouged claw marks on a nearby tree trunk. She gazes around nervously before murmuring, We're being watched. In an instant, Jakub is ambushed from behind by the monstrous beast, its long claws slicing through his throat with brutal precision as an agonizing scream fills the night. His mangled body collapses mere inches from my feet. Fear grips our hearts like a vice. Panic sweating, we ready our weapons knowing the hunt has turned to us. Attempting to call for backup is futile given our location deep within these thickets. Clutching my weapon, I yell for Euphemia and Justine to back off. We need to distance ourselves from this lethal creature. Retreat! I command. We scramble, heart pounding, and I attempt to reach our back up on the communicator, but the dense forest has blocked our reception. The creature's menacing presence is undeniable as it lets out a guttural snarl, cutting through the silence. As it steps out of the shadows, we can see its physical attributes, a large, bulky shape that somewhat resembles a canine beast, with dense fur and intimidatingly sharp claws. Its eyes hold an uncanny intelligence that only fuels our terror. As we cautiously move further away from our encampment, my mind races with potential strategies to escape this gruesome fate. Since we don't know if there are more of these predators lurking in the woods, we must assume we now face multiple threats. The potential for an ambush are high. I try to recall any similar creatures from my training or any intelligence gathered from previous encounters. Unfortunately, I lack knowledge on this specific monstrous attacker. We move deeper into the woods, leaving behind the gory remains of Jakub, unable to spare more than a few hastily whispered words of remorse for our fallen comrade. Our focus has to be on survival now. As hours pass by, we do our best to avoid being cornered. We find shelter in a secluded area framed by the natural rock formations and shore up our defenses. Given our current predicament and position deep within these damned woods, calling for help is still unrealistic, and certainly not wise since we suspect there may be more creatures stalking us. While catching our breaths among the rocky shelter's walls, weapons ready, we engage in hushed conversations about the horrifying situation. I've never seen anything like that. Justine confesses under her breath when describing her encounter with that sinister gaze she saw lurking through the thick woods. Euphemia, our scientist, says she can't pinpoint the creature's origin either and all three of us are left bewildered by our deadly situation. I decide that we must continue to fend off this relentless creature, even though we might be stuck in these godforsaken woods for days. But we can't afford to cower. For hours, we prepare makeshift traps and place them strategically according to what little knowledge we possess about this monstrous beast. As darkness falls once again in the forest, it's evident that our enemy is just biding its time. Our nerves are shot but sheer adrenaline keeps us on high alert. As the night drags on with the weight of a friend lost and suffocating unease, an abrupt cacophony signals that one of our traps might have been triggered. We carefully approach it. To our horror, Justine is the one caught in our trap. Before any of us realizes it, the creature had silently mauled her, 
and flung her lifeless form into one of our snare lines. That cold intelligence in its eyes had anticipated much of our moves. There are only Euphemia and me now, stricken with fear and despair, but it's clear that surrender doesn't stand as an option. There is no alternative but to carry on fighting for survival and honoring Jacob's and Justine's memories against this unfathomable foe. Despite all odds, Euphemia and I persist through another day in this hellish landscape avoiding further attacks from the ongoing menace. Exhaustion weighs heavily upon us both as another brutally long night approaches. Our hearts cry out for help as we begrudgingly accept the possibility that death may be our ultimate end here, picked apart by an unidentified monster with insatiable bloodlust, trapped within these accursed woods. This happened to me a decade ago while I was camping in the Appalachians. I lived a typical life, working my nine-to-five office job and blending into society. My name is Welker Banning, and I never imagined that I'd encounter something so terrifying. In search of peace, I planned my getaway to Pine Valley, a secluded area perfect for solitude. The rustic cabin I rented lay just outside town, surrounded by thick woods. On my second evening there, I stumbled upon what looked like an improvised grave, a shallow hole filled with chunks of flesh scattered haphazardly. The sight was sickening. Walking back in shock, I met Lita Rayborn, another visitor who booked a neighboring cabin. Her phone had no reception, like mine. Stranded far from help, we grew increasingly worried. A few days later, as Lita and I chatted around the campfire with our only neighbors, Roscoe Flinders and his teenage son Trenton, we discovered that all our cabins bordered the same dense woods. Each night, we heard rustling outside but dismissed it as local wildlife. However, each day revealed more evidence of something sinister lurking nearby dragging marks in the earth leading away from our cluster of cabins towards the woods, more crude burials with gruesome remains. During one unforgettable sunset, the group discovered a pivotal clue while venturing deeper into the woods, a towering creature descending on its latest prey. The beast was covered in matted fur and had massive fangs that gleamed in the setting sun while it ripped apart its meal Flinder's missing dog. Terrified beyond reason, the four of us hurried back to our temporary homes. There was nothing separating us from this thing in the woods except flimsy wooden doors. As night fell again, we joined forces in one cabin, our companionship bolstering any semblance of courage we could muster. We kept watch throughout the night, dozing off in shifts. The morning brought us relief, and with it, we developed a plan. We had two loaded firearms that we hesitantly decided to use. As the sun set once more, we steeled ourselves for what fought or flight might demand. Strange grunting filled the air around us, echoed by the crashing of branches as this predator drew near. This time, however, it didn't stalk from afar. Instead, it entered our clearing. Spotting its grotesque silhouette against the night sky and Lita's fear-filled face drove me to act. I carefully took aim and pulled the trigger, just before the creature could lunge at Roscoe, who tackled it to the ground with a panic scream. But my efforts were fruitless. My bullets bounced harmlessly off its hide as if shooting rubber. Defeated but defiant, Roscoe yelled at Trenton to run to their cabin and retrieve his hunting knife. In response, the beast roared, a sound I'd never forget, before disappearing back into the shadows like smoke from a snuffed flame. Frantically, Trenton returned moments later and handed his father the weapon. But as they exchanged terrified jests, out of breath and momentarily safe from this unknown foe, we realized something horrid. Lita was missing. In despair, 
her capture further fueled our determination to fight back at all costs. We armed ourselves with every weapon we had, rifles, knives, and our unpredictable resourcefulness. We knew if we wanted any chance of getting Lita back, we had to act fast. We gathered our supplies, a few bottles filled with gasoline for makeshift Molotov cocktails, the hunting knife Trenton brought, and whatever other tools we could find for self-defense. There was no time for calling the police or involving others. The terrain was unfamiliar to them, and we couldn't risk them becoming victims as well. This thing had invaded our safe haven, and it was up to us to protect our own. We followed the creature's path through the shattered underbrush until we reached a dilapidated old cabin deep in the woods. It was obviously not of natural origin and seemed to not have been visited in decades, warp boards barely hanging together, with moss and ivy overtaking the structure. I hesitated before entering, my hands shaky as I gripped my makeshift weapon. Inside, we saw Lita tied up in one corner, her face pale with fear but otherwise unharmed. A wave of relief washed over me until I registered the other beings in the room. The creature stood among its grotesque companions, each bearing similar characteristics, elongated limbs, distorted facial features, feral eyes, an entire pack of abominable figures shuffled within that dimly lit room. They sneered at us as we entered, baring their nightmarish teeth. Without thinking, I threw one of the Molotov cocktails at them, igniting a wall of fire and creating a barrier between us and those fiends. Trenton quickly cut Lita free while Roscoe held them back with a spray of bullets that seemed just as ineffective as before. They hissed and shrieked from behind the flames before breaking down a back wall of the cabin. We watched in terror, heart pounding, as they vanished into the darkness once more. Without wasting another second, we began our desperate race home. Once back at our haven, we took turns keeping watch with our remaining Molotov cocktails and weapons at the ready. We dared not speak of what we had seen, unwilling to put words to the unspeakable horrors that lurked in those dark woods. And despite our unspoken fears, we did not call for help. Anxiety twisted our insides as we questioned if these creatures could be part of a realm we didn't believe to exist. Days went by without any sightings or attacks from the creatures. We triple-checked every door and window and never strayed far from our makeshift fortress. However, after a week without incident, it seemed like the pack had moved on or found a new area to stake its claim. Cobbled together theories floated through my mind as I tried to make sense of what we had encountered. Skinwalkers or shapeshifters, these were words that lived in legend, myth, stories told around campfires to scare children. I never believed in them before, but after confronting those terrible creatures face to face, I stumbled over my own disbelief. Even though the terrifying days and nights had ended for now, I knew life would never be the same again. The scars we bore, both physical and emotional, would remain with us forever. We took solace in each other's company, grateful that our sacrifices hadn't been in vain. We never found out exactly what those creatures were or where they came from. My unshakable belief in the rational world rocked and shattered by their existence. Our story ended not as heroes who vanquished a gruesome enemy, but as survivors who barely escaped with their lives intact. And thus, at last, it's understood by all of us who face this nightmare firsthand, there are evils humans can impose upon one another pale in comparison to what exists beyond our wildest imaginations, lurking in the shadows of forests or hidden just beneath the surface of everyday life. But we move forward, carrying the bitter weight of a destiny forever changed. For us, we did the unthinkable to save one of our own, and in the process, we had glimpsed the unimaginable horrors that could be lurking among us.
This happened to me two summers ago. I decided to escape the city and venture into the wilderness, seeking a remote cabin in Northumberland County for some solitude. As a long-time electrician, I figured I could unwind from my job's demands. Upon arrival, I met my new neighbor, Fitz Milton, a peculiar man who rarely left his property. Despite his unusual habits, he was amicable and shared fishing tips that only locals knew. Conversations with him made time fly seamlessly. One idle morning, a commotion outside grabbed my attention. A middle-aged guy named Barrett Yates was yelling frantically for help near the cabin. His sister had been missing since last night, and he believed something dangerous was lurking in this tranquil place. My skeptical nature was unmoved by his claims, so I helped him search to quench his welling panic. We ventured deep into the woods and eventually found himself in an area we never expected, an isolated cave entrance. As an expert climber, Barrett volunteered to explore the cave while Fitz stayed outside and I reluctantly accompanied him inside out of pure curiosity. The damp air filled our lungs as we navigated the narrow tunnels with our flashlights following the only clues available, blood-stained drag marks on jagged stones. Soon enough, we stumbled upon bones scattered across the cave floor. Barrett's fear escalated upon realizing these belonged to humans, and we knew that whatever resided in this cave was deadly. I jokingly tried easing the tension by saying, If this were a horror movie, we'd be those naive characters who get killed for wandering into the monster's lair. Fortunately, or unfortunately, that statement proved true when we found ourselves face to face with an indescribable creature feasting on Barrett's sister's remains. It stood up slowly on six muscular legs covered in matted fur, its enormous body towering above us with blurred nocturnal eyes staring directly into our souls. A cry of terror escaped Barrett's mouth as he impulsively stepped back, accidentally alerting the beast. It lunged at us suddenly its powerful legs clawing viciously through the damp air. Barrett managed to roll away, avoiding the first strike. He began shooting at it with his hunting rifle, but the bullets seemed to have little effect on this resilient monstrosity. Run! he yelled as we sprinted away from the creature, dodging its relentless blows. Despite carrying her brother's wounded body and trying to outrun this horrifying monster— Barrett never let go of him. Something about their bond made it equally heart-wrenching and relieving. As Fitz tried calling for help with his cell phone, I knew we were too deep into the woods for a signal to reach us. So, when the opportunity presented itself, I told them to sprint towards the entrance while I distracted this formidable foe, somehow managing to slow it down temporarily by hurling rocks at its eyes. I stumbled upon a rope hanging from the ceiling, my experience as an electrician sparking an idea. The creature's bulky but swift form chased me relentlessly through the caverns until we reached a partially collapsed section where I prepared a makeshift snare trap with my climbing rope. Luring it towards me once again, Fitz and Barrett watched in terror as I positioned myself above it just right. Racing towards the entrance, Fitz and Barrett were desperately trying to call for help while I plunged myself into a death-defying gamble. As my makeshift snare trap was ready, I positioned myself and waited for the beast to follow. With heart pounding, I swung the rope around one of the creature's legs. For a brief moment, our eyes met. In that instant, I couldn't help but marvel at its terrifying features— elongated limbs with vicious claws, bulging muscles rippling beneath its coarse fur, and two inhumanly glowing eyes filled with malice. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before too grotesque and monstrous to be any known animal. As I hoisted myself up just as it lunged toward me, I tightened the rope around its leg. The beast screeched in pain and frustration— thrashing violently to break free from its restraints. But the more it struggled, 
the tighter the rope became. With only moments to spare until help arrived or it managed to free itself, adrenaline coursed through my veins as I clung on for dear life. Fitz and Barrett had made their way back once they knew it was safe to do so worried glances etched across their faces as they nervously asked if there was anything they could do. No, I shouted between gasps for air. Just go. Get help. Miraculously managing to hold on just long enough, Fitz and Barrett took off in search of assistance. From their perspective, it must have looked like an adrenaline-fueled act of survival, but they didn't know I was an electrician after all. As time went by, fear began creeping in that we might have underestimated the true extent of this creature's strength when suddenly reinforcements arrived. Armed with more than mere hunting rifles, their powerful tranquilizer guns loaded and trained dead center on, the creature, hefted groaning breaths, fighting against its bonds. Multiple darts embedded themselves into the creature, its fury lessening as the sedatives took effect. But as it lay on the ground, unable to move but still very much alive, I found myself shuddering at the thought of what this beast could be. It wasn't human nor was it a known animal. With no other explanation found, I hesitantly conjectured that it might be something far more ancient a shapeshifter or skinwalker from long-forgotten myths. As we all stood around the subdued creature, discussions continued on what to do with it. Having experienced its tremendous power firsthand, we unanimously agreed that it could not be dealt with by human hands alone. It was decided that the best course of action would be to relocate— and contain this beast far away from humanity's reach. We called in professionals well-versed in handling dangerous escaped wildlife while keeping the true nature of our foe a closely guarded secret. In due time, they arrived with specialized equipment and expertise, quickly proceeding to secure and relocate the creature. As we watched them take it away, I couldn't shake the lingering feeling that our ordeal was not yet over. Though we had survived this encounter, there was nothing preventing a skinwalker or shapeshifter from blending in amongst us once again. But for now, all that mattered was that my friends and I were safe, thanks mainly to relationships forged through unexpected circumstances and extraordinary bravery displayed by ordinary people like us. As for any future encounters with such unknown horrors, we resolved to face them together, side by side. However horrific and mysterious the creature was, those close calls reminded me of life's inherent impermanence and vulnerability. As long as the relentless pursuit of survival remained in each one of us human or beast our struggles would never truly end and though haunted by the lingering memory of those gleaming eyes filled with malice, I also held on to a renewed appreciation for the camaraderie and sacrifices willingly made by good-hearted individuals like Fitz and Barrett, who never hesitated to put their own lives on the line for the safety of others. And so, we picked up the pieces of our lives and continued onwards. But somewhere deep inside us, the memories of facing that beast remain, a reminder that there are things in this world beyond our wildest imaginations and terrifying truths awaiting those who dare to delve too deep into the unknown. I'm Sam Jenkins, a talent manager from Los Angeles and I'm attending a funeral in Willowbrook, near the infamous Forest Lawn Mortuary. It's a small town that feels safe, resting in the shadows of tree-lined streets and white picket fences. Willowbrook is starkly different from the fast-paced life I am used to. As the mourners disperse after the service, I find myself walking through the rows of headstones with my distant cousin, Matilda Holmes. We engage in small talk about our lives and share our mutual distaste for funerals. Spotting a figure hovering near a mausoleum, Matilda recounts a time when her curiosity got the better of her. 
I snuck into this old mausoleum once, she says with a chuckle as we continue walking. Little did we know then that she would go missing soon after. A day later, as I roam through Willowbrook's old bookstore, I overhear folks discussing mysterious disappearances in town. Intrigued, I ask for details and learn that these bizarre incidents began about two decades ago. One after another, people vanish without a trace. That same night, I can't shake off my unease while having dinner with Matilda's family. But trying to keep things light-hearted, I share an embarrassing memory from my childhood about getting stuck in a tree for hours before Mom rescued me with her ladder. The next day, Matilda doesn't resurface after venturing out for her morning run. Her husband panics and calls me to help search for her, but there is no sign of Matilda anywhere. During the hunt for Matilda around town, I come across claw-like scratches carved into trees and fences near where people once disappeared. Gathering clues together, it dawns on me that something lurks within the shadows of this sleepy town. Later that evening, while retracing Matilda's jogging route, I hear muffled cries. I follow the sound into an eerie moonlit clearing and see a creature unlike anything I've encountered before at all reptilian alienish monster feasting upon deer carcasses with glistening scaly skin and paralyzing yellow eyes. As my heart races, every instinct urges me to flee, but the reality of Matilda's disappearance gnaws at me. I pretend to walk away while stealthily staying within earshot of the creature, praying it leads me to Matilda or any evidence of her whereabouts. Yet this proves to be a challenging task as fear grips every fiber of my being. This abnormal creature defies everything I ever believed in, shattering my skepticism. For days on end, with each passing hour more agonizing than the last, I track the monster's dreadful course from a safe distance. Meanwhile, other townspeople also notice its abominable hunting patterns and believe me as we race against time to save the few victims still alive. Forming a ragtag team of armed citizens willing to endanger themselves for their neighbor's safety takes time but my determination overcomes all odds. Armed with guns and makeshift weapons and no clue about the origins or motives of this terrifying reptilian villain, we press onward. We stumble upon evidence of bizarre rituals near several crime scenes, piles of personal belongings from victims strewn across the damp forest floor. However, we are painfully aware that the clock is ticking on finding our still-breathing loved ones. Not everyone shares my dedication. Throughout our journey together, some people throw in the towel out of fear or physical exhaustion. Others succumb to tension-filled squabbles or even mental breakdowns. As night devolves into another heart-pounding chase after the mysterious beast, more tracking clues surface in astonishingly grotesque forms, faces forever contorted by terror frozen in place within sinister shrubberies. The tempo of our rescue mission hastens as we draw closer to the reptilian creature's den. Gasping for breath, we brace ourselves to confront what has wreaked havoc on our small town's idyllic existence. But no momentary courage is enough to save us from the grisly reality that awaits inside. Our flashlights illuminate the gruesome scene as we breach the monster's macabre dwelling and underground lair littered with bodies in various grotesque, ritualistic configurations. The walls seep with repulsive fluids, illuminating our terror-filled expressions amidst raw fear and disgust. Underground, the air reeks of rot and decay. Although my lungs gasp for clean air, I know there is only one goal, find our loved ones and get out alive. Panic rises as I see lethal traps carefully placed by the villainous creature to impede our rescue mission. It becomes clear that calling for help would be futile. Our voices would be drowned out by the horrors that inhabit this lair. The reptilian attacker seems to have anticipated our intrusion. Seeing its grotesque form, I can't fathom its origins or motivations. 
The creature possesses a large, humanoid body covered in green, scaly skin that glistens in the dim light with every twitch of its muscles. Its serpent-like eyes glint with menacing intelligence, while its immense reptilian maw drools venom that hisses as it touches the ground. Acting on pure instinct, we scatter in all directions to avoid becoming its next victims. Gunfire rings out in desperation as we fight to break free from its lair. Much to our horror, the monster remains unaffected and proceeds to decimate our group one by one. My best friend Charlie falls victim first, his screams echoing through the lair. Blood and gore fill my vision as I watch others meet their grisly ends, some crushed beneath massive claws, others torn apart with a chomping maw or impaled by sharp tail spikes. Despite our determination to save our loved ones and make it out alive, those of us who remain standing are cornered and weakened. In a last-ditch effort for survival, we search for any potential escape routes from this nightmare. A shaft of broken rock exposes daylight streaming into the underground chamber. Realizing it's our only chance, I sprint towards freedom as bile chokes my throat. I hear another desperate scream behind me but refuse to look back. My sole focus now is survival for myself and those still trapped within the creature's grasp. As I reach the narrow opening, clawing my way out of the abyss, I recoil from the light as my eyes adjust to the brightness. With adrenaline pumping through my veins, it becomes clear that we can't go back and face that abomination again unprepared. I hastily make my way to the local authorities to describe our harrowing encounter and inform them of our predicament. Their disbelieving faces morph into grim recognition as they promise to send aid. Days turn into a blur as local authorities, alongside capable volunteers, descend into the bowels of the earth to confront this monstrous foe. The operation is fraught with peril, and in solemn silence, we mourn for Charlie and others who fell in our initial rescue attempt. Finally, the long-anticipated news arrives— most of our loved ones have been found alive in various states of shock and fear. Their abduction had been orchestrated by this ferocious reptilian creature, a heinous act befitting a vile alien whose existence defies logic. As they emerge from subterranean depths, each person is forever changed by their harrowing ordeal. The authorities work tirelessly to reclaim bodies and destroy evidence of sacrificial rituals within various underground hideouts. It dawns on me that perhaps it's better for most people not to know the true extent of this macabre scene. Its depravity is simply too much for some to handle. Despite efforts made by authorities to rationalize their findings scientifically or attribute them to some subterranean species— no satisfactory explanation surfaces. The reptilian villain will remain an enigma, one that will linger in our minds for years to come. My life moves forward, but I bear scars that may never fully heal, both physical and emotional ones from that wretched day. Still, as memories start taking on surreal hues over time, I glance up at the sky and consider our place in the universe. Are there other monstrous beings out there waiting to strike? Or is it best to leave some mysteries unsolved and focus on appreciating our loved ones now that the immediate threat has been vanquished? Ultimately, we cannot know what lies in wait for humanity, but those who had joined me in that harrowing rescue effort can agree on one thing. They all fought earnestly for their loved ones' safety. Perhaps, in our darkest hours, that determination is what truly defines us. I woke up earlier than usual, feeling strangely restless. Mornings like these are always unpredictable. I mumbled to myself, recalling my small-town upbringing and how my father used to say the same thing before heading out to work on the farm. My name is Lawrence Butchert, 
and I live in a quiet, secluded area near Lake Cushman, Washington. It's usually serene around here, with little to excite or scare anyone, just the way I like it. In the kitchen, I made a quick breakfast and decided to go for a walk along the shoreline. As I strolled by the water's edge, enjoying the crisp air, I noticed something unusual, a strange set of footprints in the sand. They didn't look like any animal tracks I had ever seen, longer than normal and with an odd number of toes. While puzzled, I continued on my walk only to find a mutilated body lying near some rocks. Horrified and nauseous at the sight before me, it was clear that whatever caused this must be dangerous. As much as I wanted to call for help, I realized the reception was non-existent in this remote area. I cautiously approached the remains, noticing peculiar details, deep bite marks and scratches that appeared deliberate in nature. My mind raced as thoughts of a grueling predator haunting this lake region consumed me. A growing dread hinted that this nightmare was only beginning. Resolving to find answers, I returned home and started researching local phenomena that could explain these events. After hours of futile digging through archival records online, hunched over my laptop screen in dimly lit darkness masked by thick curtains drawn against the rapidly setting sun outside my window, no easy task given my limited connection bandwidth here I uncovered whispers about a reptilian creature known as Silent Stalker. This alleged beast was supposedly a cross between a lizard and an eel-like entity with razor-sharp teeth, slimy scales, and an elongated body. It was rumored to come out at night, hunting unsuspecting travelers and locals alike with a relentless ferocity. I couldn't shake the unnerving possibility that this creature could actually exist, and potentially be responsible for the frightening scene I had discovered earlier in the day. The days grew darker, and I became increasingly paranoid with each passing hour. The isolated lake had transformed from a peaceful oasis to an imprisoning cage. I found myself disoriented by strange cries echoing through the depths of my once comforting house nestled among tall pines. At one point, unsure whether I was losing my sanity or facing an imminent threat, I called my closest friend in town, Kimbra Barnwell. Lawrence, she advised soothingly through static interference on both ends during our conversation which consisted largely of my half-incoherent ramblings mixed with her attempts at reassurance while maintaining skepticism herself. You might be overreacting. Just take it easy for now. Her words failed to quell my ever-growing unease as I realized I could no longer trust her judgment or that of anyone else who might simply dismiss my concerns as baseless. The more I learned about this creature stalking my life with its terrifying silent omnipresence, minute details such as its ability to swim or climb trees yet lacking useful appendages for either task, it continued wreaking havoc on those around me. I thought back to when the police had come to my front door, their stoic expressions betraying no emotion but above all revealing genuine confusion mixed with lingering frustration regarding an ongoing series of unexplained disappearances throughout the small community which people like Officer Harrison Dobbs left a distressing impact on me. Lawrence. He had whispered grimly while gripping his sidearm tighter. Be careful. Cowering behind locked doors each night became routine until a particularly violent storm, most unlike any I'd experienced before, knocked out the power, and consequently, all my defenses. Plunged into complete darkness, I stumbled upon the glow of my flashlight as fear blossomed like a poisonous flower, gripping my chest and lungs. In the ensuing silence, I could hear someone— or something, moving outside my house. Gravel crunched underfoot, and splinters cracked away from branches that were snapped with terrifying force, a clear yet horrifying illustration of the monstrous power contained within whatever hunted me this moment. As I stood there trembling, 
I heard the faint sound of sirens in the distance, the arrival of emergency vehicles my only solace in this dire situation. The police were coming, but would they make it in time? I knew I didn't have much time to waste, so I threw open the front door and hurriedly sought refuge within my compact car parked across the driveway. The terrifyingly powerful antagonist seemed to take note of this development as it ceased its destruction of my yard and began stalking toward my vehicle. Its movements were fluid yet focused, as though it knew precisely where it was going and what it intended to do upon arrival. The reptilian creature glided across the ground with an eerie serpentine grace. It had a rough, scaly hide that shimmered a dark green under the pale moonlight, its elongated snout filled with razor-sharp teeth glistening with saliva. Sudden revelation dawned upon me as I could now see this creature more clearly. It was no run-of-the-mill criminal nor supernatural apparition. Its unearthly appearance seemed to suggest it belonged to an alien species, one that had likely hunted prey across galaxies and now found itself on Earth. And this time, I was its prey. Breathing heavily and struggling to keep my hands steady on the wheel, I fumbled with my phone to call for help. But as adrenaline coursed through my veins, I realized there wasn't a soul in town who would come to my aid if they saw what waited outside not even Officer Dobbs or any other authority figure, for providing plausible explanations would take precedence over fighting a seemingly unidentifiable foe. No one was going to help me against this alien being. It was simply unfathomable. The unnerving reptile-like creature reached my car, and with shocking velocity, slammed its massive body against the passenger window. Glass shards sprayed throughout the interior, grazing my face and torso as I flinched. The brutal impact left me shaken, but I knew I couldn't waste any time. With the roar of the engine, I floored the vehicle in reverse and then sped forward, narrowly escaping the clutches of the monstrous being. As I fled from my once quiet home and into the chaotic storm ravaging the night sky, tears streamed down my face from sheer terror and helplessness. The shattered glass crunched beneath my tires, a grisly reminder of just how close I'd come to meeting my end at the hands, or claws, of that reptilian predator. For hours I drove aimlessly through deserted streets and abandoned alleys until dawn began to break over the horizon. Exhausted and defeated, I knew I couldn't keep running forever. I needed a hiding place somewhere where that creature would be unable to detect me. Finally, after circling back to the town, I pulled into an overgrown driveway leading to an old warehouse that seemed deserted. With bated breath, I inched forward as far away from the road as possible, potentially securing my safety for at least a little longer. My flight had spared me for now. However, it hadn't eliminated the lurking threat that terrorized not only myself but also my entire community. In moments of quiet within that gloomy warehouse, my thoughts drifted to those who hadn't been so lucky, fellow victims swallowed by this monster's relentless pursuit. The sirens sounded again in the distance then. Perhaps they were searching for me or chasing their own nightmares wrought by this alien menace. Closing my eyes against fatigue and fear mangled together in exhaustion, I wish desperately for some semblance of assurance for who knows what tomorrow may hold. It was just another ordinary day when I decided to explore the expansive forest behind my uncle's cabin. Funny enough, my name's Bronson Babbitt, which you're probably thinking couldn't be more uncommon. Well, you're right. Still, I've always enjoyed the peace and serenity of nature. My uncle, Rivers Whitaker, loved hunting in these woods and had a collection of guns he could have shown me, but I wasn't interested in that stuff. As I ventured deeper into the woods, 
Everything seemed normal at first. The air was cool and crisp, and the animals were chattering away like old friends at a reunion. Suddenly, a peculiar odor hit my nostrils. It was a mixture of rotting flesh and damp fur utterly disgusting. I continued cautiously on my path until I came across something out of place, a body lying lifelessly on the ground. It was unfamiliar and mangled beyond recognition. One could only guess what gruesome act occurred here. Why didn't they call for help? Maybe they couldn't reach their phone or even scream for help due to their mutilated state. Unsettled by the sight, but with morbid curiosity leading me further, I noticed something strange about the tracks around the body. The prints didn't look like anything I'd ever seen before they resembled hoof marks, but larger and more irregular. Pushing forward, I came across an unsettling sight, a collection of bones mounted high, sort of like those structures built by hikers to mark a trail's peak. These bones were different, though. They seemed to be arranged, artistically, as if done by someone or something with intent. Then again, did you hear about the skeleton who couldn't go to the party? He had no body to go with. Ha! Ha! What a way to lighten up my increasingly tense exploration. But as much as I tried to crack jokes, the atmosphere grew darker and heavier, and a feeling of being watched crept over me. There was a palpable tension in the air that I couldn't shake off. Was it my imagination, or was there really something lurking nearby? Just as I started to question my sanity, I caught a glimpse of a towering creature out of the corner of my eye. It had a tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs, and its head looked like a deer or stag skull adorned with sharp antlers. The monstrous entity stood still for a moment, as if observing me before it effortlessly disappeared into the shadows. Did, did you see that thing? said a voice from behind a tree, giving me quite the scare. It was Rosalind Ollinger, another nature enthusiast who couldn't believe her eyes either. We discussed our mutual encounter and decided that remaining together would be safer than going off on our own. Still unable to call for help due to lack of signal deep in the forest, we relied on wits alone as panic ebbed and flowed within us. We continued cautiously along the path, uncertain if we were going deeper into danger or closer to safety. Our hands trembled as we simultaneously reached for branches to steady ourselves during particularly slippery parts of the trail. Each strange noise amplified by our pounding hearts. As night fell and the forest darkened further, we found an improvised shelter that had evidently been used by some past inhabitant of these woods for respite. A few discarded cans around the area prompted us into an impromptu game of Kick the Can! anything to pass the time until morning. Laughter filled the air briefly but abruptly halted when we heard another noise, like guttural growling. The guttural growling seemed to echo around us, making it difficult to discern its origin. Rosalind and I exchanged uneasy glances as we quickly extinguished our only source of light, a small flashlight with dwindling battery life. We were hesitant to call for help out of fear of attracting the creature directly to us, and our lack of signal had already rendered our phones useless. We both held our breath, listening intently for any signs of the creature's whereabouts. The forest went eerily silent, and we wondered if the creature had moved on or if it was preparing to strike. After several minutes passed without further incident, we mustered enough courage to continue making our way through the dark woods. Rosalind and I reached an area with dense vegetation and realized we could use it to our advantage. We thought that hiding in the thick brush might conceal us from the creature long enough for it to lose interest in pursuing us. Never having encountered such a terrifying beast before, I regretted not having any knowledge of folklore or cryptids that could potentially help us survive this ordeal. Nevertheless, as we made our way through the undergrowth, each rustle of branches raised our heartbeat as fear enveloped us like a dark shroud. 
We took refuge in one particularly thick grove of trees with an unspoken understanding that this might be our temporary safe haven. As night shifted toward daybreak, hours of stagnancy began taking its toll on us. Our eyes were heavy with sleep, but adrenaline kept us on high alert. Exhaustion clung to every muscle as we tried in vain to keep watch for any signs of the monster looming nearby. Suddenly a blood-curdling scream pierced through the early morning silence. It didn't take long for us to figure out that the creature had discovered another unfortunate soul lost in these woods. Rosalind and I looked at each other, silently acknowledging that we had to make a move or risk becoming the monster's next target. Our limbs were heavy with fatigue, but our will to survive was stronger. We cautiously emerged from our hiding spot and scanned the surroundings, looking for a direction that might lead us closer to civilization. We walked along the tree line, hoping to stay hidden while covering as much ground as possible. The light of day offered little comfort, exposing us to new dangers and perspectives we couldn't see in the dark. But we had no choice. Staying in one place was becoming perilous. Our journey continued into the late afternoon as we moved through dense foliage and rugged terrain. The hours of trekking and the fear fueled by adrenaline finally paid off when Rosalind spotted a distant highway winding through the forest. The sight brought renewed hope, and we pressed onward determinately toward our escape from this nightmare. As we traversed through a shallow stream heading toward the road, Rosalind's foot caught on an underwater rock and she stumbled forward with a startled yelp. In that moment, instinct told us that we had made a critical mistake. Alerting this hunting creature to our location would only hasten its pursuit. But as Rosalind looked up at me, her face smeared with mud and determination, I knew either of us was willing to give up just yet. Eyes constantly scanning the tree lean behind us, we pushed toward the highway growing ever closer. Distance from the creature couldn't be accurately measured. Sometimes it seemed miles away while other times it felt like it stood right behind us. And then finally, with muscles burning and hearts pounding out of our chests, we reached the roadside, our path to safety. We frantically waved down an approaching truck driven by a burly trucker who listened to our story with more skepticism than sympathy. But he allowed us into his cab anyway. As we sped away from those shadowy woods and the monstrosity that lurked within, I couldn't help but shudder at the thought of that other lost soul we had heard earlier. Whoever they had been, their sacrifice had inadvertently led us toward our escape. The creature with its elongated limbs and deer-like skull would haunt my sleep for years to come, a reminder of how close to death Rosalind and I had been on that fateful night. But the memory of that terror would also serve as a constant reminder to never venture unprepared into the unknown. The sun began to set, and the shadows grew long around me. I couldn't forget that joke my friend Yarmar Sabotka told me last week, though for the life of me, I couldn't recall the punchline right now. It's funny how some memories just hang there, waiting for something to make it meaningful again. My name is Cassius Vargas, and I was drawn to this place for reasons unknown. At least that's what I thought until a few days ago. Something about the vast and rugged landscape of the area captivated my senses. As I walked further into the remote part of Utah, it became clear that something was attracting me here. A sense of purpose began to emerge from within. I stumbled across an old cabin in the wilderness one day, a seemingly abandoned relic waiting to be discovered. As I explored the weathered structure, an uneasy chill ran down my spine. It wasn't anything paranormal or unexplained. There was just a palpable feeling of abandonment lingering in the air. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as if sensing a presence nearby. A sudden shriek shattered the silence, echoing through the dense trees surrounding me. Instinctively, 
I tried to reach for my phone to call for help but realized any signal was scarce out here. With no choice left but to investigate, I cautiously moved toward the sound. As I approached its source, my skepticism slowly gave way to terror as I caught a glimpse of something unnatural in motion, an atrocity too bizarrely grotesque to be considered human. Its tall lanky figure loomed menacingly over its latest victim, with limbs stretched longer than humanly possible. Its head resembled a deer or stag skull adorned with sharp antlers protruding outward like a sinister crown. The creature snarled and grunted as it feasted upon its prey with ferocity. It didn't merely kill. No, it was as though it wanted to eradicate any trace of its victim's existence. Driven both by fear and curiosity, I fumbled for my camera and snapped a photo. However, before I had a chance to escape back to the safety of the cabin, the thing turned to face me. Paralyzed by terror, I could only watch as it started inching closer. My heart raced, and I could feel sweat pouring down my back, but all I could do was stand there, watching my doom draw nearer. Desperate to remain undetected, I searched for something, anything to protect myself. My hand reached into my backpack and grabbed a flare gun. Anything seemed better than facing that creature unarmed. As the creature neared, the sky seemed to darken, making it even more horrifying. Its grotesque form loomed over me, casting an impossibly large shadow on the ground below. With a primal snarl, it lunged at me with those elongated limbs seeking to do what they'd done to its previous prey. In its eyes, I could see my gruesome demise. My hands shook with fear as I aimed the flare gun at it and fired blindly. The shot struck its bony head causing it to reel back from the searing heat and vibrant glow now shining in on us like an unwanted spotlight. The creature hissed in agony before stumbling away into darkness beyond description. Wasting no time while the beast recovered from its injury rehabilitates itself, I sprinted back toward the cabin where this all began just days ago but feels like a lifetime. Tearing through the dense foliage that attempted to swallow me into its tangled mass forced myself on with determination knowing there was no other option. The sound of snapping twigs drowned under my panicked footsteps resounded through the increasingly sinister air around me. However, I knew not whether they were mine or that abomination pursuing in hot pursuit ready to enact a terrible vengeance for the brief reprieve I had bought myself. As the cabin came into view, sweat continued stinging my eyes as I blinked it away, trying to focus on reaching my destination. Panic-stricken and gasping for breath, I felt a tightening sensation in the back of my neck, a feeling that can only mean one thing, I'm being watched. I pushed through the cabin door and slammed it shut, turning the lock with trembling hands. I needed to call for help, but my phone was out of service. I contemplated screaming for neighbors, but the cabins were far apart, and who knew if anyone would hear or come to my aid. Footsteps crunched outside the cabin. My heart pounded in my chest as I frantically searched for something to barricade the door. The heavy wooden dining table seemed like my best option. Summoning every ounce of strength, I dragged it across the floor and propped it up against the door. A guttural hiss echoed through the night followed by scratching and banging at the door, the sound chilling me to the core. The creature was relentless. I could hear its breath as it put its weight against the fragile entrance. As seconds turned into minutes, an idea crossed my mind fire. Fire had saved me before when I shot the flare gun at its skull. In desperation, I gathered whatever flammable materials I could find in the cabin books, papers, pieces of clothing and piled them near the door. Behind me, a window beckoned. Although it was small and high up on the wall, it was my only escape route. With shaky hands, I smashed the glass with a chair from beside the table, sharp shards of glass littering the ground. A guttural growl came from behind the door. It was only a matter of time before it got in. Gripping the lighter from my pocket, 
I lit some papers aflame and threw them onto the pile by the door. The fire roared to life in an instant, engulfing everything around it. Breathless and desperate, I scrambled onto a nearby cabinet and clambered toward the shattered window. Slivers of glass cut into my palms and legs as they made contact with shards still stuck in place. Ignoring the pain, I slid my body through the opening, dropping to the ground on the other side. The sound of wood crackling and flames devouring the cabin was drowned out by the creature's eerie shrieks as it continued to try and break down the now-burning entrance. I sprinted away from the cabin as fast as my legs would carry me, following a barely visible path through the forest. The darkness of the night swallowed everything I left behind, my footprints, my blood, and the creature. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity— I reached a clearing with a gravel road. Down to one direction was a familiar sign, Sarah's Cabin Rentals. I walked in that direction, not knowing how much time had passed since this nightmare began. As soon as I reached the main office building, I pounded on the door with every ounce of strength left in my body. Henry, Sarah's husband, opened the door with wide eyes. What happened? he exclaimed before seeing my injuries. Without uttering a word or wasting time explaining, I pointed toward the landline phone on a nearby wall. He complied immediately and handed it over. Dialing 911 with shaking hands, I managed to utter two words. Police. And. Ambulance. As Henry tried to tend to my wounds while we waited for help to arrive, questions pouring out of him unheard by me, my thoughts were consumed by one fact. I had survived. Whatever that creature was or where it came from did not matter. It couldn't hurt me anymore. In time, others would find out about these bizarre circumstances and question their plausibility. Some may even attempt investigations or searches for answers. But as for me well aware of the unknown creature lurking in those woods curiosity won't be anywhere near strong enough to erase my newfound appreciation for life and desire to keep it. So bring thoughts washed over me as I sat in silence, waiting for the flickering blue and red lights cutting through the darkness of that unforgettable night. I always thought I'd be the last person to end up in a bind like this. Me, Arlo Gantry, a simple man who crosses the country in an 18-wheeler, transporting goods from one end of the U.S. to the other. Right now, I was making my way through Wyoming's remote stretches towards a little-known drop-off point. It was nestled between vast open plains and the austere beauty of jagged mountain ranges. The kind of place you miss if you blinked while passing by on I-80. The sun was beginning to dip low, casting elongated shadows across the asphalt when I noticed my fuel gauge edging towards E. Damn thing must be busted. I muttered, remembering the fill up just a hundred miles back. No matter, there was a small old gas station not too far ahead according to the faded highway sign. As I pulled up to the dusty pumps of Clayton's last chance gas, a sense of unease crawled under my skin, not due to the name, which I found quite amusing, but something about how desolate it was here. The place was deserted with an eerie kind of quietness that made even the soft hiss of my idling truck sound intrusive. I went inside seeking assistance and found myself in a room filled with old trinkets, and highway souvenirs covered in dust. No attendant in sight, just an open ledger on a counter with recent transactions penned in shaky handwriting. Strange how there were transactions but no soul around. While pondering this oddity, a glint from outside caught my eye, a reflection from something metallic among the shrubs bordering the station's perimeter. Out of sheer curiosity, or maybe my nature to investigate oddities, I approached it. Hidden partially under a brittle bush was a camera, high-end and barely concealed. 
What sent cold dread down my spine wasn't just its discovery, but what lay beyond it. Fresh disturbed earth formed into an unmistakable shallow grave size impression that you'd pray never to stumble upon. Before my mind could process this chilling find further, metallic clicks reached my ears. Someone watching? Ambush? The distant hills seemed to mock me with their silence. There he stood atop a small rise, a figure bathed in the tangerine glows of sunset. Details absent save for his form. Broad shoulders leading to an upright stature that suggested undeniable strength. Why was no one else alive around? Why didn't anyone report him? How could anybody have ever escaped such an adversary? My heart pounded as footsteps signaled his descent towards me, each step deliberative and assured against loose gravel. This man didn't bother with stealth or disguise. He wasn't flanked by monstrous creature or wielding curses. He didn't need to. His mere presence wielded enough threat. I knew fight or flight were equally futile notions against an antagonist whose very existence remained shrouded while reality laid bare his capability for violence. I abandoned any thoughts of sprinting back to my truck wouldn't make it five steps before bullets spoke louder than any engine roar could. My fingers subconsciously traced over items clipped on my belt, keys, pocket knife, useless trinkets before such foreboding approach. The figure halted. He stood edge of the light and darkness. I saw him clearly now. Tall, more than six feet, and strong. Skin the color of ash— perhaps from working outdoors, well-defined jaw shadowed by a day's growth of stubble. Eyes like cold steel, void of empathy, locked on me. Hair short, unkempt, dark as the failing light. He reached inside his coat and pulled out a weapon a hunting knife glinting with intent. This was not his first time using it. The blade was worn, stained with history he wore like a badge. There were no words exchanged, no need for them. His goal was clear. I thought about running but dismissed it instantly. I'd only make it easier for him. The distance between us closed with each step he took. His attack swift, relentless, left little chance for defense. A cut deep across the arm of a man who stumbled upon us accidentally this morning— hiking through these abandoned hills too early to avoid fate. Blood spilled over rocks that should have testified silence rather than screams. Why didn't I call for help? No signal here. I checked when I first found the grave. Now there was another man bleeding out beside it. I glanced down at the figure motionless on the ground, John Doe. I silently gave him that name since he had none to claim. With John Doe down and momentum lost, I took my chance to run towards my truck parked far enough to reach without a bullet catching me first. I drove straight to town, barreling into the first phone booth I saw, punching 911 with hands shaky but determined. Police arrived fast but not fast enough for John Doe. They secured the scene while EMTs confirmed what silence had already screamed John Doe was a victim without witness or justice. This stranger marked graves not by names but by those who discovered them and paid for curiosity with their lives. After days of investigation turned up little else than more questions, my statement still fresh on record as the sole survivor's account. Attacked by a man after finding a grave in remote hills— Attacker tall, strong built. Weapon was a hunting knife. The local paper ran with it. Mystery in the hills. Hiker stumbles upon a scene of violent past. No conclusion given beyond caution being wiser than valor in unknown territory. And so it ended. Or began again. Who knew how many knew this story before me or would after? Standing at my window now. Looking out towards distant hills veiled in quiet normalcy while realizing some threats need no introduction. 
They just wait for unsuspecting lives to cross paths with violent histories that refuse to remain buried. I remember it was a typical morning when I turned the key in the ignition of my rig, preparing for a long haul to the outskirts of Reno, Nevada. My name's Harlan Griggs, and 18-wheelers have been my bread and butter for longer than I'd care to admit. The landscape stretched out before me, dry and vast, so much land with nothing but sagebrush and the Sierra Nevada silhouetting the horizon. The job was routine deliver construction supplies to a developing area where the buzz of new homes was about to break the quiet. It was a solitary drive, one I'd taken time and again, but solitude was a companion I had learned to embrace over years of trucking. The route snaked through remote parts of the state, where cell service became a luxury and radio stations fizzled into static. Halfway through my route, I decided it was time to stop at Walton's Diner for my usual mid-drive meal. The old bell above the door jangled as I stepped in, drawing glances from a few locals who seemed planted in their booths like fixtures of the place. After a meal that included more grease than anything else and small talk with Maisie, the aging waitress with platinum curls who knew me by name, I hopped back into my truck. The sun sat lower as I continued on what should have been an uneventful stretch until I reached Reno. That's when I stumbled upon something that would stick with me far longer than any road memory should, the remnants of what looked like an animal in the middle of nowhere. Not uncommon given wildlife but oddly, there were belongings scattered nearby, a tainted wallet that belonged to someone named Clayton Hollis, torn clothing, and what appeared to be remnants of camping gear. No animal could have done this. It looked deliberate. Pushing aside an unease that knotted my guts, I called it in using my satellite phone since no signal graced my cell. Maisie had always told stories of folks running into trouble out here, people getting lost or worse, but I never took her seriously until now. Explaining the situation to a skeptical dispatcher who probably pegged me as another weary trucker seeing hallucinations in desert heatwaves felt futile. They promised the local patrol would swing by eventually, but eventually did little for immediate concerns. Picking up speed now more eager than ever to leave this unsettling scene behind me, dusk settled like an unwelcome shroud around my cab as I pushed on toward Reno's promise of civilization and away from this desert enigma. The satellite phone lay within reach should events turn anywhere south from dubious discomfort. Not because of fear. I'd long buried that under miles. But due caution warranted by unfamiliarity with whatever game fate decided to play today. In my rearview mirror, dust kicked up by something other than my own passage caught attention. It felt off, like stacking oddities onto an already peculiar day. It grew darker still when headlights shattered the anonymity provided by night with persistent intensity following at an unshakable distance behind me. At first speculation suggested they might belong to some late traveler or ranger drawn by dispatch promises. Still, it didn't account for their silence over CB channels common among professionals or law. Intensity built as time rolled on. Miles crawled under tires shadowed by insistent luminescence gaining proximity without intent other than maintaining deliberate pace. One that felt ominously purpose-driven more than coincidental overlap in travel patterns. Then chaos unfurled rapidly. A cascade of force slammed into the rear of my rig sending shutters through metal frame. There wasn't just a description for shock. A collision, sure but unprovoked and malevolent in its execution leaving room only for instinctive control maneuvering hoping against grim odds for escape outcome from encroaching peril. Gripping the wheel, I floored the accelerator. The other vehicle responded in kind, 
its engine roaring through the silence of the night as if taunting me to a duel I wanted no part in. Thoughts turned to the satellite phone. Why not call for help? My eyes darted over every inch of the dark cab just inches away from reach. No signal. No quick rescue from circumstances spiraling fast into nightmare territory. Another jolt sent a sharp jarring through the spine of my truck, threatening to veer it off into the barren desert beyond the road. I clung on, muscles working overtime to stabilize the vehicle at breakneck speed, steering through the relentless assault as flares of panic erupted only to be quelled by raw survival focus. The aggressor, a man as implied by his rough grunt when our bumpers clashed, seemed content merely keeping pace and striking with precise, fierce blows against my rear bumper. We barreled on metallic growls between us replacing any human dialogue that might shed light on his motives. Past a particular turn, a brief glimpse in my mirror revealed more than just aggressive pursuit. His face appeared worn, scar lines trailing like badland gullies through dirt-smeared skin, a map of someone living on these very roads by harsh rule rather than choice. Through relentless pursuit, he harried me towards a bridge known for crossings scarce frequented due to structural concerns. An idea formed— Desperate but the only one left, slow down at the bridge's entrance, and hope his momentum took him past me. I executed this plan with every ounce of timing I had nurtured over years' steering wheels. It worked. His vehicle barreled past in a storm of dust and curses each meant for wounds rather than words exchanged during chase. The assailant crashed against the railing metal shrieking under force before going silent as still night returned, a false peace hanging heavy with implications of his possible end. But speculation stayed brief. A groan confirmed he survived. Hurt maybe? Before long, sirens echoed from afar. A fellow traveler had alerted authorities after witnessing parts of our high-speed dance with danger. Rescue arrived soon after, and it was there in conversations with officers a name came up. Whispers marked him Samson, the local who policed these roads with brutal intent forged from loss cruel and personal. Officers recounted stories where travelers went missing, suspected Samson's relentless way of retrieving justice for family taken by hit and run years back on this very stretch of highway. Silence claimed my voice on hearing tales too real blended within each small community where lives intertwined closely. In days that followed reporters swarmed seeking sound bites from anyone involved. I declined participation holding sight firmly ahead instead where road continued far beyond today's horrors which would likely hold fresh ones anew come daylight's call. Whenever I think back to the harrowing events, the crisp morning air and the chittering of woodland creatures fill my mind. It's funny how you can work so close to nature yet be involved in something so unnatural. My name is Arvel Marecki, and I'm a geneticist at a secluded government facility deep in the forests of the Olympic Peninsula. My team and I alter life's code in ways that nature never intended. The day started with Cleona Hanley bemoaning her spliced petunias that refused to flourish, a small but relatable failure among us gene wranglers. Genetic roulette. She had called it with a wry smile, trying to break the tension building over our real work, engineering something formidable, secret. Yet there was no levity when we found the lab animals, subjects of our latest experiment, brutally slaughtered. Entrails smeared across pristine white tiles in a twisted display, a macabre artwork dictated by a mind unknown. Phones were useless here. Our isolation demanded self-reliance, or risked everything we did being exposed. As the day progressed, anxiety tightened its grip. 
Dr. Cornelius Betzinger swore he saw tree branches contorting outside his window, an illusion wrought by tired eyes, surely. You keep jumping at shadows, Corny. Soon you'll scare them away. I jested half-heartedly. We decided to canvas the woods for signs of poachers or predators as gunmetal clouds smothered the afternoon sun. Maris Colt carried her rifle with ease, a testament to off-the-grid living teaching more than just wilderness skills. Ever hear of Chevail, spirit warrior of legend? Maris whispered through the timberland maze. Her question unsettled me. I preferred science over myth. But as we stalked through the underbrush, what we encountered couldn't be filed away neatly in logical thought. A creature loomed before us, not entirely animal yet not human. It moved with a grace that belied its hideous frame, twisted limbs and eyes which reflected a cold malice, echoes of folklore but alive and breathing in our reality. Chaos erupted as it charged, an irregular gait driving it forward unnaturally fast. Maris shouldered her rifle as Dr. Betzinger fumbled futilely with his sidearm. Shoot! She screamed with chilling calmness, splitting the afternoon silence with ear-shattering reverberations. There was no time for shock or horror for just as quickly as the beast appeared— it turned and darted deeper into the forest, leaving behind an unmistakable trail of destruction, and one of us wounded, perhaps fatally. We scrambled back towards our concrete sanctuary when we heard it, not steps but a cacophony of rustling, a pursuit less by foot and more by an unseen force propelling this abomination towards us relentlessly. Adrenaline coursed, each beat of my heart was a drum signaling retreat or doom. We dove into labs turned labyrinths as this forest-born terror defied all rationale by penetrating our place of work. How could something so arcane display such cunning? The labs, once filled with precision instruments and the hum of computers, now resounded with the thudding of our frantic steps. Dr. Betzinger stumbled beside me, gripping his arm, blood seeping between his fingers. Lock the doors, he gasped as we pushed past the heavy steel that barred our retreat. In the control room, Maris slammed her palm against the emergency shutdown. Red lights flickered on, casting a sterile glow over us. We need to call for help, she declared, her voice hoarse but resolute despite the chaos. I'll do it. I volunteered, my hands tremor-free as I dialed the number we hoped never to use, the direct line to local authorities trained for dangerous wildlife encounters. Our breaths hung in silence as the phone line buzzed its monotone song before a voice answered. This is security. State your emergency. I explained our situation in measured words while glances were exchanged around the room. An animal, large and aggressive, it's inside the facility. We have an injured man. My report was factual. My language selected for clarity over dramatic flair. I left out assumptions about what attacked us. Not a word on folklore or unproven existence. Only described what we saw, a quadruped form, larger than any known local predator, with matted fur and scars across its snout. Details meant to ensure maximum response efficiency. As we waited for help to arrive, barricades were hastily constructed at doors with tables and cabinets, each action a study in survival instincts honed by unexpected circumstances. Dr. Betzinger's injury seemed severe. He groaned each time he moved his arm, and so I turned to basic first aid procedures learned long ago pressure application and makeshift bandaging using materials torn from lab coats. Hours passed, a tense vigil marked by occasional sounds from beyond our sealed doors. Thuds against walls suggested continued interest from our unwelcome guests and injected fresh urgency into our defense efforts. Maris rationed water from our supplies and distributed protein bars meant for extended experiments. Stay quiet, 
she instructed when noises neared. Don't draw attention. We obeyed as precise clockwork. The only sounds were whispered when necessary. Rescue arrived with daybreak. Armed officers trained for such encounters who moved methodically through corridors until they reached our stronghold. Is everyone accounted for? Their leader scanned each face froze signs of injury or shock. We nodded except Dr. Betzinger, who could just muster a pained acknowledgement of their presence before succumbing to unconsciousness born of blood loss and fatigue. He was rushed to medical attention alongside authorities determined to locate and handle what roamed our halls, an assurance offered even if belief in their success wavered among us who faced it firsthand. In the aftermath of quiet halls restored, whispers among colleagues spoke of events hard to process. Facts struggled to align with experiences too extreme for neat categorization within scientific paradigms. There were casualties beyond Dr. Betzinger's wound, one lost in an attempt to find escape when corridors turned hunting grounds, a grim reminder echoed by empty desks in days following. Inquiries followed. The how dissected more thoroughly than what? No carcass discovered despite efforts. Only deep gouges and metal doors as testament to reality witnessed by those who remained alive. Speculation abounded even as management urged discreet discussions, a consideration for professionalism outweighing curiosities pulled towards understanding creatures lurking beyond fences that marked human domain from wild unknown. But not even closure gifted conclusive answers, only reinforced glass now separating lab spaces from surrounding woods where eyes might watch unseen observers who pondered phenomena unfit for textbooks yet undeniable and havoc wrought upon lives thrust into roles unchosen, victim-survivor witness. All merged in narratives formed beneath canopy where science met survival and stark juxtaposition of everyday work transformed unforeseen ordeal tackled without preparation found within guidebooks or manuals. Weeks past operations resumed with improved safety protocols but a tangible shift persisted within walls scarred by intrusion a community bonded together by shared trauma mindful always that beyond assurances lay unpredictable nature capable of horror leaping forth from shadows, if given opportunity again. Anyone who has ever held the weight of a secret knows the heavy burden of silence. For me, that weight was nearly tangible as I maneuvered through the dense forest of Pine Creek Gorge in Pennsylvania. The government facility hidden within these woods was my workplace, and the classified nature of our research felt oppressive among the seemingly innocent chirp of crickets and rustle of leaves. I remember how that morning began just like any other. Marlo Hitchcock was already at his desk when I arrived mumbling to Emberly Pratt about the unreliable coffee machine that seemed to mock our dependence with its sporadic performance. Our camaraderie was often punctuated by these trivial jokes about caffeine addiction. It made the eerie serenity of our secluded sight bearable. Emberly tossed me a sly smile when I walked past. Guess it's tea for you today, huh? The day unfolded with routine tasks until I heard Marlow utter a confused curse from his lab station. A generator malfunction had caused a security breach in one of our most sensitive projects. Genetic experiments aimed to push beyond the boundaries known to modern science. We regrouped hastily, each person recounting their steps leading up to the incident. This wasn't just a simple error. It was catastrophic. Marlowe's usually calm demeanor had evaporated into a mixture of panic and disbelief. As we trekked through the forest towards our backup power unit, I considered how unrealistic this scenario would seem to any civilian. We drilled for emergencies, but nothing quite like this. Loose protocols were simply not part of our lexicon. 
We found Harlan Grimes lying near the unit, still and silent in contrast to the panicked shout that had escaped my lips moments before seeing his body. No call for an ambulance would help him now, deep within classified territory where phone signals were purposefully non-existent. Harlan's fate was sealed by secrecy and seclusion. Further investigation revealed disturbing signs, odd prints around Harlan's body, and trails leading off into thicker foliage, an amalgamation of human meats, animal-like markings. Rage built within me like a silent crescendo as we followed what might be tracks, but to what end? As evening approached and visibility dimmed beneath the towering pine's canopy, our search became more frantic. Emberly raised her rifle, a necessary protocol, her grip steady despite her rattled nerves. Our radios crackled with updates back forth between us and base command information merged into action plans and contingencies blurred amid static and urgency. With only a sliver of daylight plunging through the trees ahead, Emberly motioned towards a shadowy figure. It emerged like a foul memory made flesh. It resembled folklore tales we'd scoff at. A hybrid beast with feral snarl laced in human mimicry that stood oddly on two feet. Features grotesquely etched in moonlight. I leveled my own gun reflexively but knew no bullet could solve this enigma. A creation perhaps birthed from our own doing? The air grew thick with tension as it moved unnervingly silent toward us. A predatory dance between unveiled monster and weary prey. I froze. The figure had features that one might expect on a bear, but twisted in such a manner that it defied natural order. No fur covered the bulbous head that swiveled towards us with eyes sunken deep into sockets that were too human. Its mouth, agape, revealed jagged teeth unfit for an omnivore. The arms hung low, ending in hands where there ought to have been paws, each digit tipped with claws that seemed forged for tearing. Just yards between us, Emberly whispered a curse under her breath. We knew our training did not cover this unnatural scenario. Against policy but correct for survival, I lowered my rifle slightly. Any hostility might provoke this being we didn't understand. The creature lunged at Davy, the youngest among us. He screamed as it tore through his jacket as though it were paper. Bright red blossomed against the dark fabric as the forest swallowed his cries whole. Emberly and I backed away slowly, eyes glued to the horror before us. We needed help but dared not look away to reach for our radios. To do so meant turning blind to an immediate threat, an inadvisable action when inches away from unknown death. The others panicked. Gunfire erupted unprompted and rang deafeningly in the confined space between trees. The bullets met their mark yet seemed no more effective than stones thrown by children at a behemoth. Davy lay unmoving. Instinct pressed me into immediate action despite my numb mind. Base command. I blurted into the radio with trembling hands. Officer down. Creature unknown. Silence followed my report. No orders returned, no voices to guide us next. The being focused on Ben next who stumbled backwards and fell to the ground in his haste to escape death's clutches. It was upon him within seconds. The sound of tearing flesh filled the air between shots that continued sporadically as horror shook everyone's aim from true. I acted without conscious thought pulled Ben back from immediate danger by his collar, while Emberly provided cover with precise shots meant not to hit, but intimidate enough for momentary respite. We carried Ben who was still alive but barely holding on to life, his leg left behind evidence of a struggle no one should ever witness. Reaching a clearing, we set Ben down with care while someone managed to splinter radio silence long enough to inform incoming help of our coordinates. Helicopter blades cut through the near silence moments later, 
salvation arrived from above in a windstorm of noise and motion as medics descended upon our makeshift camp. They declared Davy beyond aid, a bitter pill that none could swallow without the taste of guilt lingering behind. Paramedics hurried Ben into a waiting bird, one filled with rumbling engines and flight back towards patches of humanity scattered amongst nature's unforgiving vice. As the creature melted back into shadows too thick for twilight's fingers, I thought only one clear thing. Some things in this world resist identification, a fact more terrifying than any legend passed through hushed whispers around campfires beneath stargazed canopies. We said little on return flights home, collective silence and unspoken agreement not to voice the whirling chaos each felt within, each trying hard not to remember how easily metal gave way beneath claws meant for cruelty incarnate, or how quickly life could bleed out onto soil rich with pine needles instead of blood. In briefing rooms washed sterile with fluorescent glow days later, questions arose like specters none dared answer convincingly. We spoke of defending ourselves against predators known and strategies effective against them, skirted around truths no one cared to acknowledge about entities walking lines blurred between animalistic hunger and human malice. Families mourned privately. Commendations were given in public ceremonies, small consolation for lives cut brutally short by violence incomprehensible. Davy would be remembered, at dinners amongst peers or silent nods shared between passing acquaintances who understood what lay behind downturned gazes. My own thoughts often wander back, not searching for answers or contemplation over nature's cruel jokes but simply remembering sounds and images cursed into memory's vaults where they reside uncomfortably like unwelcome guests we wish we never invited inside our heads. Damp earth mixed with copper tang hung heavy around boots stained irrevocably now leaning forgotten by doors once exited through confidently before whatever manner of beast rent reality's fabric came crashing violently into life previously untouched by nightmares given raw and savage form.